What's up, potheads and political junkies? You're watching Cannabis Culture News Live. I'm Jeremiah Vandermeer, editor of Cannabis Culture. And Johnny is with me, Johnny B. What's up, Pot TV? My wingman today. And it's week three of the Allard trial. We wrapped it up today. Yes, and it was. And right here in the city of Vancouver, we have the most important medical marijuana trial going on in Canada. And yeah, I'm saying more or less in the world. It might be the most. It's definitely the most important to us in the world. Right. Um, so the set's looking a little bit different today, and that's because we're having a bit of a party here. Let's get you guys a view of the room here. So we're at 307 West Hastings down at the Cannabis Culture Lounge, and we have the big Allard crew in the audience today. What's up, guys? What's up, guys? Let's say hi to Pot TV. Good to have everybody here. It's been quite a week, actually. We've been uh, battling it out in the courts. John Conroy's in the house. We're going to talk to him today. We got Jason Wilcox in the house. Yeah, a lot of information for you guys. We got, we got all the key guys uh, that are here in BC that have been fighting for the, our rights to grow our medicine that are here. Bob, Jen, there's a lot of people in the That's house. That's right. Tonight. Here, I'm going to get the crowd cam Take back on there. Take a good look around. Yeah. Freddie in the, the corner. Crowd. Yeah. yeah, Freddie. We're going to play one of Freddie's videos Jay, a little later on the Chris. show as well. Neil Magnuson's here. Neil. On the phone right now. Yeah. Woo! Lots, lots of key names, players. So we'll be talking here. to everybody about what's been going on. But Johnny, I want to talk to you first, my friend. Yes, my friend. And because you've been sitting with me in the court for the entire thing, live tweeting. And for those people who want to uh, watch this at home, you can, or see the live tweets at home, go to Cannabis Culture's uh, Twitter page, which is twitter.com slash Cannabis Culture. Johnny's tweets are there also because I've been retweeting a lot of your stuff. There you go. So we've been uh, working together, actually tweeting and trying to get the edge, trying to get the news out there exactly what's been happening in the courtroom on a daily basis from both of our views. So uh, it's uh, been actually there's been a lot of like hilarious moments I'd have to say in the oh, court. Yes. Besides the fact, I think the reason that we're feeling good about everything is because we're doing very well. Um, or at least from my perspective, I'm trying to be objective as a journalist and look at the case objectively, but I think our team's doing a really good job. Well, you know what? I, I'm saying with the first week that we've talked about and the last, the last three episodes, so I guess we're going to uh, sum it up with the, this week's basically uh, uh, testimonials were all professionals from other countries and it was it was actually quite a good education listening to how the other countries like Israel the Netherlands and the US have adopted new programs and have grandfathered in old old uh, licenses that were growing and then how things slowly changed over time but there's a lot to come I think it was a uh, very interesting uh, to listen to uh, the professor from Israel and how he has uh, spent so much time dedicating his research and uh, well, he's very much involved with helping the patients there, and you were seeing quite a difference in how Israel has changed in a way of trying to help the patients that I saw on stand. I can't quote that from the country because I wasn't, uh, I don't know the whole program exactly, program I should say, but otherwise, uh, the Netherlands, they had one, str basically, one company growing five strains, and there's a lot of controversy around that, so... Uh, you know, when they started off with having a system just like uh, Canada uh, back in the late 90s. And by 2003, they were radiating weed that was grown by a couple companies. And over time, became one monopoly of one company. Uh, anticipating 12 to 15,000 uh, oh. patients using uh, medical cannabis. Yeah. And turns out 600 applied. Definitely and some, some crazy over expectations that just Just crazy. Fulfilled. Weren't fulfilled. And actually, you know, this is one of the, the points I think that was important in this case is that there's always this overextension of the program at first, and they, they think that so many people are going to use the program, and yes. really it ends up being not very many people because they haven't factored in things like the black market. They haven't factored in that people will, you know, well, we, just, we had an economist here. Um, what, I can't, what's his full name here? I got that Yeah, one. we got a, I can't remember names yeah, either, his, but his name I mean, is a tough one. It was, uh, <laughs> where is he here? Uh, or is all my papers? That's the one page that we're missing. It was uh, Groot, was his first name. Groot, Grootendorst. Grootendorst. Grootendorst, that's right. And he was an economist who was a pharmaceutical economist. But yes. he was making also some claims about how large the industry would be the potential LP industry and he was saying it was going to be a very very large market uh, without actually having any real evidence of that and it kind of in the same way but that I felt the people in the Netherlands and other places overextended their views about the way how large the program was going to be at the same time but what they did is they they, they uh, anticipated such a large market and like what John will bring up we'll say with the two million patients using or even a half million patients out of the 28,000 patients that are using would be more or less only five percent of the overall market so how would it even hurt the, the market so it was very interesting 
interesting in how that was ripped apart and stuff like that, but I'm sure yeah. there's more to come. Are you trying to turn the in-house mics up? The, the turn the in-house mics? Right here. Hey, Brian, maybe Brian can. Brian, can you turn up the in-house mic for us a little bit? Just uh, ma- a few notches and see how it sounds. We don't, we don't want anything to feed back, but it's, I think that uh, one of our, we've lost one of our four speakers today or something. We've lost one of them. There we go. That's there a little bit better. Yeah, hopefully uh, we're going we're gonna to try and turn your mic down a little bit here. Okay. Okay, I've moved down the mic, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. Is that better? Don't eat the mic, Johnny. Thanks, guys. Should be good. We're okay, trying, so that's we're trying a little to get better. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they like that better. Okay, good. So, yeah, I mean, we had a lot of... Uh, we had a crazy week because it started with... Um, sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me here. Um, yeah, th- this week was good because I thought we had some, uh, some of our people kind of come across as really decent. We had Tim Moen, who was one of our plaintiff witnesses, who was there to rebut Len Garris's testimony. Um, and Tim, and also we had Will, Scott Wilkins in, um, and that was interesting as well. He, Scott was an insurance agent who talked about... Oh, that's right, too. So yeah. now we're getting back. You know, I've just been paying attention to the last few days, but now we're going like, to go back at the beginning of the week. I know. Like, witnesses we have. Oh, wait a second. So many There's witnesses. There's been a lot of people that have so, come through, actually. So. Yeah, with Tim Owens, it was great listening to how he went on about um, fire and safety inside grow rooms. And actually, yeah. um, he was the leader of the Libertarians. Yeah, he's also the one, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. Yeah. But that wasn't really what he was speaking on at all. No. It really didn't have anything to do with that. Okay. But uh, I hope we're not feeding back on the, the mics here at all. Hopefully, if there's feedback on the mics chatters out there, let us so know. So what we had is we had, a, we had the fire... Um, well, he wasn't a chief. He was... Um... Well, there was Len Garris who started the week. Yeah, he was now, the he fire was from chief. Surrey, the fire chief from Surrey. Now, he had nothing but bad things to say. He was, of course, the government's, one of their star witnesses. On all illegal grow-ups. So that was one thing. Yeah, we get in percentages that uh, 1% of all fires caused were through meth labs and cannabis grow-ups, but they didn't have the details. And that was one of the things that was so brutal about Len Garris's testimony, is that every time they talked about these so-called fires that medical marijuana grubs would cause, they were lumping them in with meth labs at the same time. So all of the data that they actually had was lumping them in with meth labs. And so they couldn't really separate out, first of all, marijuana grows themselves, and then on top of that, separate out the medical marijuana grows. Yes. You know? So there's a well, lot they had of... No, they had nothing on medical marijuana legal grows uh, of fires in, in the city of Surrey. Uh, that's what they stated. There was 33% of the fires were created through stovetops. Um, so there were some good statistics that came out. Yeah, um, well, because kitchen fires are really the, the thing that causes fires in homes. They're kitchens. So long story short, uh, at the end of the day, um, fire uh, created by uh, grow ops. Um, I guess we could throw that one out the window, eh? Well, and that's the, that's can, the whole can we thing. Honestly, we should as, give a little as, bit of context here because okay. really what John is trying to do, first, he's got to do two things, Conroy and his team for the Allard side. First of all, he has to show that the government, or the, by changing the program from the MMAR to the MMPR, that it's violating. We're getting some feedback. Brian, Brian, can you turn it down just a little bit? It's getting feedback on there. Um, so first of all, he has to prove that the Section 7 rights are being violated and that patients have to choose between their liberty and their freedom. That's the reason why we're in court. Yeah. Sorry, their liberty and their health. That's right, which is, yeah. It's, it, it, you can't, and according to the Charter in Canada, you, you can't be forced to choose beto- between those two things unless there's a damn good reason. So if they are being violated, the government has to prove that there's a reason to do it, and that's their saying is fire, grow up fires, and things like that. Well, they were really pushing, like today, it was more on the mold side. Um, but I mean, getting back into the fire and you keep mold. talking. I'm just going to go over here. For yeah, a second. getting back into more of the fire and mold. Uh, when when he was testifying, they really had no solid evidence. All of the evidence was based barely on illegal grows. Um, there was nothing on cannabis grows. They had no solid evidence. They had no pictures. Um, there was just really nothing there. So um, said and done. By the end of the day, um, we talked more about insurance, and then we had the insurance guy. Uh, he came in out of uh, Abbotsford. And uh, he talked about how he had 300 licensed uh, MMAR grows insured under the program. And out of those, um, only eight had to upgrade their power bars and stuff like that. So the, everything was all certified. So they really had nothing on when it came down to dealing directly with uh, any of the legal grows causing any problems because we had some certification. So 
you know, all in all, I would say that uh, on the fire and mold, what I see is uh, they really had nothing to go on other than what they've seen uh, uh, hearsay and, of course, through illegal uh, activity that has uh, shown in the papers that I've seen here in Vancouver. Most of the pictures I've seen have been uh, meth labs blowing up. So when they put that into a small percentage of 1% of all the illegal activities dealing with cannabis and meth and labs and other activities were caused uh, were causing fires so said and done guys um i think we're we're out the door with that these guys are still trying to figure out the sound over here have you got have you got it all figured out have we got it all figured out i think so hopefully sounds so, a little better so, so we went on to the first day with the insurance guy and i told him kind of a bit about what was going on um, now you so, can talk in the mic a little bit louder. Okay, so then we were going on with that. On the next day, who came up next on the next day? That after was, Garris? After Garris. It was Tim Moen, and yeah, he was the guy. He's also a fire chief. He's from the city of Fort McMurray, and he was there to debunk Garris's testimony. Or and I basically yeah. told him how the percentages, the 1%, the meth Rebut. labs. The re yeah, so out, out, out the window. rebutting everything, essentially, saying that, you know, Garris didn't really have the evidence that his... And actually, we even have an article published in the Globe and Mail, or was it the, the Metro? I think it was the Globe and Mail, about Garris, saying that he didn't really have the evidence to back up his own affidavits. Yes. So that was really awesome to see that. Um, yeah, hopefully that's a little bit better out there for the chatters. And in-house, in it sounds better now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so Tim Owen was awesome. I thought what he did a great job. What did we do on the next job. day? What did we do Tuesday? So, Scott, so that same day, though, after Tim came Scott Wilkins, yeah, who he was, was an insurance, insurance agent, agent for LNG. Now, That's this was, it was LNG. Yeah, LNG. And they, they also created another thing that was really interesting to hear is in the last three months, they've created a program uh, so they can get health benefits, so they can get their cannabis covered, too. It's called Green Shield. Thank you. Green yeah, Shield. Yeah, Green Shield. And now, check them out. Green according Shield. According to Matt Murnau, I had a conversation with Matt over text yesterday, and he says that Sun Life is also now offering medical insurance for cannabis people. Yes. Um, really interesting. Sun Life, yeah. Really, and really So really it sounds cool. like insurance companies are starting to come along on things a little bit. Um, here, let's, I'm going to show them the audience right now. It's getting packed in here. Yeah. Yes, it's slowly filling Very up. Very smoky more in people here. Are showing up. And there's, yeah, there's on the wall, there's a big picture of uh, the coalition banner over there. It's got, everybody's up there signing it and stuff. Sign the coalition Are they signing banner. it? I think people are going to sign it if they haven't already. I was told oh, they is are. that a big and black felt pen and everybody's signing the coalition banner? That's kind of cool. <laughs> so, there you, go. you know what? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, coming I up made next a, was... I made a uh, picture of yeah, Len that Garris. Was, that was the, the captain. That was the him. chief, Mr. Mo. That was on the Tuesday. And on the Wednesday, uh, who, who came up after that? On Wednesday, we had Robert Mikos, who was a law professor from Vanderbilt University. And we that also... That was Israel. That was... I'd love that. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so then that's, that's what I was really excited about. Is then, then we had... The expert well, witness was that talking came in about from the U.S. He, first. He was talking, that's the one. Yeah, and he was talking about uh, basically across the United States, uh, all, all the new in laws, favor for, for all medical. Of the, all of them have had a medical program now implemented. So Yeah, um, and all of the legalization states. He went through the details of each different thing with us. And actually, uh, Tanya was Grace able to grow. went through basically endless details. Remember, it went on and on and on. On we and went, on and on. We it, it looked learned really every good. single thing about the United States' is Medical program, medical program and, and legal program. recreational program and what they're that anticipating could, so. to go legal with New Hampshire and Delaware. Like he was listing off things that are just like, yeah, yeah. Even it's just like basically the U.S. is going to be legal within well, the next. Well, and what happened years. was because there has been since October when these the, these affidavits were submitted, that a lot of stuff has changed. changed so and much. so they had to go through a whole bunch of new stuff. Happy 420! Happy 420! It's 420 here at 307 West Hastings in Vancouver. Smoke them. We definitely need to be smoking something, Johnny. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, John has had his med tainer in court, and he's been uh, every, uh, every day after court, he breaks out the med tainer with the fatties in it. We've been hanging out a lot and puffing down after the case. Um, we got scolded today standing outside the building there because we were smoking time. for the first time. <coughs> I think that's because we were sitting near the vents and the smoke was going in. So on 420, if you're leaning against uh, the building on... Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to 701 Georgia and lean against the building on 420. Now, mm. see, for, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Well, I was going to just 
say something about 420 um, this year. We've been getting things set up for 420 yeah, okay. and really planning. You mentioned 420. I just wanted to say that. I'm not going to say everything, yeah. but we're working on uh, bringing you a bigger production this year. And there seems to be a few little hiccups here and there that we're trying to overcome. Um, there may be some friction with the city actually. Yes, yes. Um, there might the, be a little friction I, I with the I have a feeling city. they don't want us to put Expand. our stage on the back stairs. But there's a lot of safety issues that I was bringing up and that you brought up about actually having the extra, you know, stage and, and, and the extra, uh, well, first aid and stuff like that for the amount of people. So Well, we won't get into it too much on this show, but there's a lot of stuff about the way we used to do 420 um, the past few years that I, we think would be safer in our new way. The city doesn't really want us to change things because they don't want us to expand at all. So <laughs> we might have some, um, some battles ahead of us to actually work with the city or get them to work with us and give, give us what we actually want. So yeah, Mikos so was cool. Let's go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're back to the experts from the U.S. Yeah, Mikos was there to talk thank about you. everything that happened. I would like to say thank you to him, and I think I did because he, yeah, gave, he lot gave a evidence. lot of solid, good evidence towards patients' rights. But I didn't agree with his conclusions, though. Okay, because yeah. he, he was a government witness, and his conclusions—if you go back and check the Twitter feed—a lot of the things he said were that he thought the trend was towards personal cultivation being removed completely. So the point that the government, the whole point in him being there with the government was so that they would. You know, he would have the opinion that they're, that's, they're taking all the personal cultivation away in the United States. But he also stated that uh, they never took away the rights of patients that already were growing. But right. they slowly... He, under cross-examination, he cross had to basically admit that his conclusions weren't necessarily 100%. That's right. That there was a lot of sort of minutiae. They, 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 they said it was... Too, and they asked why. I like that. I like to get John up here. They asked why they didn't do that. It says, too, too much in course of trying to take away the people who are already growing rights away. And that is also out of Israel and the Netherlands. I think all three countries agreed with that. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of what I look really at. Really what the evidence shows is that legalization of all cannabis is taking hold in places like Alaska, Oregon, yeah. Washington, Washington, D.C., D.C. And uh, Oregon, yeah, there's, yeah, Colorado. So there's, and, and with in the new those ones places, I said in a lot of those places, home growing is allowed as part of, as part every, of the bill. Every one. Yeah. No, well, not everyone. Not Washington no. State. Washington State. There aren't yeah. a lot of so many can't plants. Home grow yet. Really? Sorry, sorry, Washington. Yeah. I apologize. That's sad. But the trend, though. I got one. It, it, oh yeah. The These trend, are the ones. We've been working hard, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've been we've been there since 9:30 every morning. Every day. The tweets, and so there really every is a comprehensive day. happening of what's been going on in the court on the Twitter pages. Um, but yeah, so after Robert Mikos was there... Um, he was done for the day, and then the next day, we had, uh, we had the gentleman from Israel who That's was... Right. He, uh, he was all day that day. He was all day. Yeah, and he took... Yeah. He basically... And the Israel? So much information. Okay, so and then, this so is yeah. great about the next day, because Thursday... Oh, no, was that Wednesday? Uh, it was on March 11th, which would have been Wednesday. Okay, so that would have been the longest day that I've known of court. Yeah. It went to after 6 p.m., that's out right. of respect for this, professor, this, this professor who started out, well, this, this professor knew a lot about medical cannabis. He talked more about uh, CB1, CB2 receptors, how it helped patients so much. He showed videos on how patients were helping uh, from what different conditions. Um, what was some of the conditions they were dealing with? Uh, um, ALS. Right. Um, yeah, there were about, in the video, they... But, they but, the big one was ALS, I think that... Uh, oh, no, Parkinson's was one of them. Parkinson's, yeah. ALS with the climber. There, there was... But, but a long story short, the professor had put in a program, and he was the one who had been behind it, who had built it, was passionate about it, and built it for the patients. And he, and he, he straight out told how cannabis was a medicine. Um, I think the U.S. agreed with that same subject, and Canada also agreed that cannabis was a medicine. Right. Um, so we did hear this over and over. So yeah. a, a lot of good no, stuff. No, it was great to see him because he was a doctor who was very passionate about the science of marijuana and how it can actually help people and their ailments. Now, he was a government witness. Again, he was a crown witness, and he was there to talk about um, certain restrictions to the program there uh, in the Netherlands and um, now he now he actually was responsible for a lot of what 
the program has seen over the years yes. in the Netherlands and for where it's going in the future. Yes. Um, so he had a lot of really in interesting information about, you know, um, some things that I hadn't heard about, about particulars about the science of cannabis. And I That's actually really I truly, so I thought he was being very honest and I believe what he has to say. He's a doctor. And, you know, he was taking, of course, doctors, though, in modern medicine take a very, they, everything has to be empirically proven. He can't just make a bunch of claims uh, without... That's what I like so much being, about him there. Yeah. And so he was, of course, a little bit reserved because of that. He's a doctor. He can't just come out and say, cannabis cures cancer. Although no, he, he did talk about the relief of tumors and things. He talked about the benefits. He never talked about cures, and he kept right. saying that. Yeah. Um, he talked about how he set up a program. Um, Israel has an oral, oral program where they offer uh, cookies. Uh, for use, yeah, and they offer oils for adults and dry. The cookies bud. are only for kids, though. That's right. It's interesting how they talk about how the cookies are for kids because uh, they can't standardize the dosages because the way the cannabinoids work is saturated fast, and you'll never get a standardized dose, no matter what you do. This guy's a scientist, so no matter what you think, he's right. Um, I'm going to believe him because uh, this is what they do in Israel. They're leading research behind cannabinoids and, and cannabis research. So yeah. it was really, really good to hear the information he talking about how uh, CBD binds to CB2 receptors, uh, and he gave a lot of good information to the courts to put into transcripts for the courts to refer to as in how cannabis helps as a medicine. And for me, it's big because I'm going to refer to it in my Supreme Court challenge, trying to prove cannabis helps people suffering from serious injuries. Right. So it's, it's stuff that's being put into the court system stating in how cannabis helps Right. Um, and it was just great on that, and, and that's why. Sorry, I think before I said, I may have mistakenly said that he was from the Netherlands. He's from Israel. And in the, the program in Israel, the medical marijuana program, is the biggest one in the world. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, so, 100%. and they've been doing this for a while, and there's Long a lot time. of, yeah. A lot of great data. That's why you see me so happy and smiling here, because it got put into our courts. We can refer to it upon court cases now with stating how much is put. I mean, I just can't wait to what's put directly into those 100 pages yeah. um, and what we've heard. But, I mean, that's the other I, interesting I'm excited thing. to see that for patients. And, and, and for the that was dumped onto the record, basically. Yes. That uh, you, know, you could tell that John and the other lawyers were attempting to put a lot of stuff on the record because in the future it means that it can be used in court and it has other ramifications by putting it on the permanent record like that. And so, and, and a lot of interesting things like even the name of like OG Kush coming up, the definitions of these things. So there's some pretty funny stuff. Yeah, no, there's funny stuff on that. I'm not end, sure why that would be relevant in any future case or anything, <laughs> but. <laughs> so, so that was interesting to have um, Yehuda Baruch was his yes, name, yes. and we actually got to watch his video uh, or a video made by some filmmakers, and he was featured in it twice. Now, the video we t we talked a little bit about how the, some of the people featured in it. It was really uh, about the benefits of cannabis. He said he didn't agree about the miracle-like properties of cannabis, or that yes. cannabis was a miracle drug, quote yes. unquote. And uh, what was funny was that, well, it wasn't that funny, but the lawyers couldn't figure out how to make uh, the video work at one point. And, and unfortunately, we were like watching it in the crowd. We actually found it on YouTube and we were watching it in the crowd. Because, yeah, that's funny. And he yeah. referenced that today and in the judge court. Today actually <laughs> talked about that. He talked about the fact yeah, that we were watching the thing in court and was laughing. Uh, and that was because the, uh, the final ending closement, John wanted, re but, uh, wanted to redo the video. And he goes, well, uh, people in the audience seem to figure it out, basically. Yeah. didn't say the audience, but... I wonder if he was reading our tweets or something. You I know, know you like, said that. It was yeah. funny. But back, back, back again, we jump off. Um, so it, it was really good. We got to watch that video. That's what took us past the 6 o'clock mark. I think we're in there until 6.10. Yeah, that video ran us long. Um, but then, so on the 12th... And, and, and the reason being for that, um, out of respect, the judge let the courts go longer so this professor could go to Tilray so right. they can go and take a look at their facility and see what they're doing and offer them some advice on what they're doing with their systems and stuff. Right, so he actually said in court that he had a meeting with Philippe Lucas from Tilray to go to. And it was important for him. And, and you know yeah. what? It was good to see that they gave him that respect. Whereas the day before, uh, this is funny, the because, U.S. professor yeah. needed to go back because he needed to teach school. And the judge goes, yeah, that's not yeah, a big deal. Your students can wait. And he missed his plane. So it was funny to the see the next day. making jokes about it, too. And he's like, well, your students will can, when you go back, you'll be double billed and you can Tell him about your adventures in the great north. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's right, too. Yeah. And, and then the next day, he let the court go longer, specifically, so this professor could go take a better look at the research. Yeah. So well, it's only that fair. was some respect. That was nice yeah. as the judge, Judge well, Phelan. I think the judge was respecting the patients in yes. the case. Exactly. Because, you know, these witnesses are here to, and the judge at one point said, this isn't for the brevity or for the witnesses' sake. This is for the, the plaintiff's sake or the people who are fighting 
this case. So, you know, the, the judge has been really good about allowing us the time to actually do what we need to do. Yeah. A and also the, the government allowing them the time that they need as well. And, you know, and object the, the judge has pretty much allowed most of the objections to go through. So uh -huh. when people stand up and object, the judge has kind of been like, okay, go ahead. D you yeah. know, overruled. And he overruled. goes... Overruled, yeah. Then the next day was uh, the lady from the Netherlands. That's right. Now, she was very interesting as well. Her name very was Catherine Sandvos. Yes. Sandvos. And, or Sandvos, maybe. But, yeah, she, uh, she was the head of... The Netherlands medical marijuana program, basically, it, since it's inception, I, I think, I think, I think the head of the program too. What's going well, on? Should, well, shouldn't we get John up here? What's that? Well, think people want to listen. We're going to get John. As, okay. Yeah, we're going to get John up in a couple minutes, and we're going to get Jason after John in two minutes. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so and then, then after that, we're going to play some. So of basically, Freddie in the Netherlands, we went over the laws, the access, um, You're, how this is where the bedro can, where the number one uh, growers for the Netherlands now. About two minutes. One minute, actually, probably. <laughs> I'm just... We're going to wrap this up. So, some, somehow, we're going to get John on here. We can yeah, get yeah, going yeah. on. I just want to make sure that your microphone is okay. Um, they're saying that your mic is a little bad, but we yeah, want to make no, sure that it's cool. Bad. So, uh, you know what? I'll take your mic when we switch, and then we'll go. But yeah, thank you, Johnny, for coming As on. As always, we can get John We'll have you back to smoke back. some hash soon. Of course. And, uh, John? John... John Conroy is going to come up next. So, Johnny, come John, on over. John, John, John. The other John. We got two Johns. We got two Johns. My two Johns. So, here we go. Thanks, yeah. John. Now, I'm going to give you this microphone. John. Thank you. Ha -ha. John, so good to see you again, my friend. Thank you so much for everything. Wow, it's been quite a week, this one. <laughs> now, I had the it's chance... quite a three weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's been quite a three... Well, exactly. Now, somebody in the crowd, it was Neil, actually, was like, you know, are we going to win? And I know you can't answer that question. <laughs> but I just, I wanted to... I talked to you after week two and asked you how you felt. How are you feeling after week three? Well, I think that our evidence went in uh, well, and I think that we managed to uh, limit their evidence. We'll have yet, uh, we've got until April the 7th now to get our uh, written arguments in, and that means we have to uh, summarize and uh, channel all of this evidence and fit it into the uh, Charter of Rights uh, legal argument and, uh, you know, argue to the judge, uh, try and persuade him as to what evidence he should accept and what evidence uh, he should reject. And so that's going to be a lot of work between now and April 7th. And then the uh, government gets uh, a week to then reply to that. So they've got, I think it's April 17th. We then have uh, another week to get in a, a short reply to their written materials. And then finally, the week after that, uh, on April 30th and uh, May the 1st, we make oral submissions. So we still have a lot of work to do in order to uh, convince uh, Justice Phelan to see it uh, the way we submit uh, it should be. Um, as I say, I think that our evidence went in well. I think uh, I'm optimistic that uh, we have persuaded him that this engages Section 7 of the Charter, the rights of uh, Canadians in terms of their liberty. and the security of the person. We were all uh, fortunate since 1982. We have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Section 7 says we have everyone in Canada, not just Canadian citizens, anybody who's in Canada has the right to life, liberty, and the security of the person and the right not to have that taken away, except in accordance with special principles of fundamental justice. And the courts have defined what those principles are over the years. And so we know it's obvious that liberty's engaged, that a patient who is unable to have a supply of cannabis, who resorts to an illicit market, uh, puts liberty at risk. We also know that uh, if the patient goes without their medicine, uh, that puts the security of their person at risk. So we know those two elements of Section 7 of the Charter uh, we submit are clearly present. The more uh, difficult question for the court will be, uh, in our view, is which principles of fundamental justice? And has the government, in the way it's done this, acted in a manner that has deprived patients, who f medically approved patients, of their liberty and the security of their person in a manner that's inconsistent with principles of fundamental justice? Which ultimately is unfairly, in a, in a 
unfair manner, but in the law, things get more uh, defined in terms of specific words, and arbitrariness is one of them. We say that, uh, we argue that it was arbitrary in that to do this without ensuring that everybody was covered is inconsistent with the uh, Food and Drugs Act and the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. Remember, the Supreme Court of Canada in the supervised injection site case from just around the corner here, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada held that the government in not uh, uh, extending the exemption for uh, the supervised injection site was violating Section 7 of the Charter and uh, because it was acting inconsistently with one of the purposes of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which is the protection of health. And so uh, the court, uh, in an unusual move, ordered the government to keep it open, and, and that's uh, not very uh, common in, in uh, terms of uh, uh, decisions of that kind. So we know we've got liberty, the security of the person, we have a submission that it's arbitrary, but we think that we have an even better, stronger submission on a principle that's called overbreadth. When the government goes further than necessary, it's overbroad. It doesn't need to take the patient's right to grow their own or have a caregiver grow for them. Uh, we argue that that's going too far. And it's tempting then to bring in all the stuff about the fire and the mold and so on and so forth, but really, in the constitutional framework, that actually is, is a, in a separate section which I'll called Section 1, we say that all of that's all Section 1 stuff where the government's trying to limit your constitutional right. And they have the onus then of proving that there's sufficient evidence to warrant limiting your constitutional right. So we think the real battle or the real issue is did they act arbitrarily? Have they acted over broadly, gone too far? And finally, have they acted in a way that the result is grossly disproportionate. It results in grossly disproportionate effects. And of course, we argue if you take away the ability of patients to produce for themselves, particularly those who can't afford to purchase from the licensed producers or even from the, the black or gray market, uh, it's obvious, just as with food or herbal medicines, an individual can produce these sorts of plants and things for themselves more cheaply than anybody else can do it for them. And so, and the government, we say, has failed to, to adequately ensure that that occurs. And in the result, there will be some patients who will suffer grossly disproportionate effects as a result. So that's the, the Section 7 issue is life, liberty, security of the person, and these principles of fundamental justice. And that's the real uh, uh, issue, in our view, and, and where we have, in our view, strong evidence and then it shifts to the government on all these other issues. And of course, uh, we submit, uh, number one, they haven't actually prescribed them in the law, which is one of the requirements of Section 1, uh, but that they're not demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society because e we think the evidence supports that every single complaint or type of complaint that they brought forward, uh, the evidence shows that they're all remedial. They're all things that can be taken care of. They're all things that can... Uh, uh, quite easily in many cases be, be dealt with. The only sort of little thing in the middle of all this that, uh, you know, you look at growing food for yourself on the one hand and not having to go through all of the requirements that they talk about and you know that you can have mold and all the rest of it from growing f even food in your house and these sorts of things if you do it in the same way. So, you know, uh, the same for herbal medicines. If you go to the Richter's catalog, you'll see all the seeds and so on you can buy for all sorts of things that are held out uh, as herbal medicines. But they aren't controlled drugs. And so that's the, the little difference in this. Simply because cannabis is a controlled drug, it's taken out of the natural health care products regulation, specifically in Schedule II. So we say if there's an analogy it's to a natural health care product, a plant-type uh, medicine, as opposed to the pharmaceutical model, which is the model that they are saying they're trying to treat it as much as possible like any other narcotic. So those are the issues that are, you know, Judge Phelan's going to have to grapple with. He's going to have to listen to me and Kirk and Tanya and Matthew and Bibas <laughs> some more. Well, he seems to be enjoying himself. <laughs> well, you know, he's uh, certainly... He's cracking uh, jokes. ...seemed to be... Uh, uh, 
he's got a good sense of humor and uh, he seemed pretty fair and you know independent and uh, what more can you ask for? That's uh, the role of the judge and again I say uh, how lucky we are uh, to be able to take a case like this forward uh, under the charter uh, in Canada where uh, if uh, you say that your constitutional rights are being violated you can bring an application under Section 24 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to have a court uh, declare on it, and everybody else who is in the same position as you, uh, is who will be affected by it, uh, benefits from the decision if, if it's ruled in your favor. Obviously, it doesn't benefit if it goes the other way. But, I mean, you, that's something that... Uh, anybody can do in Canada under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So, um, it, you know, we're lucky to be able to, to bring it forward and have an independent judge uh, hear the case, hear both sides of the case, and hopefully make a decision in our favor. Thank you. Oh, Neil, Neil, hold on a second. We're going to turn your mic up here. All right. Uh, you you, you show, said that the onus is on them to prove that there's some reason for them to do that. Is the bar not set considerably high for them to have to sh th show that there's a good reason? And do the, the rights of people that are sick, have are, are they any higher than, say, just an ordinary person? In that, is it not as simple as a sick person should be able to try what they want for themselves unless, you know, unless they're harming somebody else? Well... It's not quite that simple if the government of the day has declared it to be a controlled drug. That's the point. You can grow your own food, and maybe if you don't do it properly, you'll harm yourself. You can grow your own natural health care products, and maybe if you don't do it properly, you'll harm yourself. Most people, especially if they're ill, uh, want, don't want to do something to make themselves worse. They want to do something to make themselves better, and you'd expect that they would use common sense and reason to do it. However, the human being is not uh, always that way, and uh, I'd probably be out of business as a lawyer if uh, everybody was always doing everything completely correctly. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> no human be nature is, uh, you know, we, there are issues. But the point you make about the onus, again, the, the important thing is uh, we, we bear the onus of establishing the Section 7 violations. We have to show that the rights of the medically approved patients, their right to liberty and the security of their person is being deprived and has been deprived in a manner that's inconsistent with principles of fundamental justice. It's a government that has done that. Then the onus shifts to them, and it is a high onus, especially when Section 7 of the Charter is involved. The cases, the Supreme Court of Canada on numerous occasions I said it's, it's not an easy thing to override principles of fundamental justice, to limit principles of fundamental justice that, you know, protect liberty and the security of the person. So they do have a heavy burden uh, as long as we establish the Section 7 violations. Now, and it seems like to me, we have had Garris in earlier in the week, and we had, you know, other people speaking on some of the concerns about growing operations. But just, I'm trying to be as objective as possible. Obviously, you know, I'm heavily biased. But the government doesn't seem to have much of, like, they haven't been able to show to me, or at least even in the evidence itself, their own witnesses have had to sort of go back on even what's in their own affidavits in certain ways in, in saying that, you know, there's really maybe not as many harms or the statistics that they've showed or the data that they've shown doesn't really prove that there's harms. Well, you know, I have to be a bit careful sort of arguing and commenting at the evidence at this sort of stage, but I think, again, it comes back to um, the cannabis was driven underground. And when it's driven underground, all kinds of shortcuts and uh, people are doing things to hide from the law hey. and so on and so forth. And so uh, there's no doubt that there have been widespread uh, violations in terms of some homes and there have been uh, unsafe situations. I mean, that has happened, but it's happened primarily, it appears, on the evidence in the illegal market, and not surprisingly so. I think, as, as uh, uh, Constable Holmquist said, certainly at the injunction stage, uh, people who are growing legally, while uh, there's obviously some evidence of people growing legally not complying with bylaws and other things that they're supposed to. Uh-oh. Hold on one sec. Hold on a second. Stepped on the cords over there. Are we back? 
Are we back? Are we back? We're back. Okay, good. So, right, you know, uh, the illegal growers have given the industry a bad name. Let's put it that way. And have given uh, evidence of all of these sorts of problems. And um, we think and we submitted and that even legal growers, even though you have to have security and, and you're legal and so on, because of the stigma that continues to exist, a lot of people don't want their neighbors to know. And uh, so their concerns about their privacy, of their health, or simply that they're using cannabis as, as medicine uh, has caused some people not to comply with bylaws and things of that kind. We fully argue that, you know, we're, we want, uh, and we're arguing on behalf of people who do comply with all the laws, and uh, argue that there should be some confidential basis on which to do it for privacy reasons. Uh, but at the same time, there are lots of people out there who have licenses, medical licenses, and who want privacy, but they're stinking out the neighborhoods. And I get lots of emails from people uh, saying, you know, what are you doing? Uh, our neighbor, I can't go out on my back porch and have uh, a barbecue anymore. I can't uh, uh, take my kids out there, you know. There, there are people out there who are not supportive of cannabis. And just as we don't want people to interfere with what the quiet enjoyment of our property, we have a duty to try and, and not interfere with their enjoyment of their property. And so if you're stinking out the neighborhood, you're inviting an invasion of your privacy, and you're alienating people who we want to have on site <clears throat> in order to have cannabis accepted as a mainstream thing. You're not going to get them all voting for Mr. Trudeau and the Liberal Party uh, because of their position on legalizing marijuana if you're stinking out the neighborhood. They're going to vote for the other guy. So I mean, you've got to think about your conduct and, and how it impacts on other people. And that's, the, in my view, one of the most important things that I think the community needs to, uh, to, to see. It's becoming mainstream. Uh, it's going to be legalized. Uh, they're not going to undo, unroll what's going on in the United States right now. It's uh, daily what's going on. Uh, there's some dangers, though. <clears throat> I, I read in the paper that the uh, conservatives in this country are suddenly resurrecting the, the police chief uh, uh, decriminalization traffic ticket scheme. And that means that the conservatives realize that there's votes to be had in the marijuana community and they're trying to now cut into yeah. what Trudeau is gaining. And uh, this traffic ticket scheme, I mean, there's constitutional questions about it. How do you, uh, you know, most traffic ticket schemes are provincial and local and municipal, not federal. The feds will try to use the Contraventions Act, which they use at the airport, stuff like that. But there'll be battles over that. Is it criminal law or isn't it? Because if they remove it from the criminal law, from Schedule Two of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, that is huge in terms of a change in the law. But if they use a traffic ticket scheme, and it may exist for a period of time before it's struck down in the courts, the problem is this. What is the thing that most interferes with people's liberty and causes them to be upset at the police? It's traffic tickets. You know, they will, they, it's a cash yeah. grab. It's a interfere with your liberty far more than what is happening now in terms of simple possession. Sure, there's still lots of people who are charged with simple possession. A lot of them, in my experience, because I haven't had to defend people for simple possession for a long time, although the amount sometimes of a simple possession charge is much larger than it was in the old days when people used to go to jail for a joint. But, you know, right. nowadays... Um, it's usually somebody smoked in the car or has got some fresh marijuana in the car. The officer, you're at a roadblock or you stop for speeding or something like that, which, by the way, this is the fundamental rule. If you're going to break the law, only break one law at a time, not two. So if you're going to be smoking in your car, don't speed. <laughs> so that's Jeff Steinborn uh, from Seattle. Uh, the big time marijuana lawyer, that's Jeff's uh, line. We give him credit. Could we, so, uh, could we have one so last question, please? 
Well, okay. well, well, hold on a second. Hold on. <laughs> let, let him finish his point, Rainbow John, and then you can get a shot in here. But we'll give you a second. Are, we're, we're are we under time constraints? No, no, we're not under time constraints. Oh, I wonder. Oh, are you under time constraints, <laughs> Rainbow John? I beg your pardon? Are you under time constraint? Uh, under what, what constraint? No, 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 no. Okay, I, well, I've let, let him let go ahead with no. okay. Sorry. Where, I, where I, were I, we? <laughs> yeah, it, go ahead with your question. Okay, so. my question uh, is somewhat broader, but it does touch on a matter you brought up, and it's very relevant at this time when we're dealing with matters that have to do with the courts. I do know, for instance, that we're only one step away now for the return of the Bank of Canada to the people uh, for its proper use uh, a, a fraud which has existed and was reported to the RCMP 42 years ago. Now, 42 years is a very curious number, but it does, time does work in some strange way. That whole issue now is public, widespread, widely understood, and to such an extent that people are looking towards here in Canada a very bright future free from the oppressions of the current status quo of which you are a celebrated member. Now, the, the, the issue I'm speaking to is common law. Now, at this time, you may or may not, or anyone here may or may not, and this may be news to the general population, don't, please don't rush me. We've all got lots of time. Right. Now, I'm I, I, I'd to like you to get to your point, though, John. Okay, my point is, well, I think I'm speaking to Mr. Conroy, but I appreciate your keeping me <laughs> well, right. We're both please, long speakers, please, but I'll be keeping... It, I'm, I'd like to keep it... Please don't interrupt again, please. Uh, for the benefit of what I'm trying to say to Mr. Conroy and everybody here. I don't know how many people in this room, Canadians all, and I'm not a Canadian, I'm still a British observer. I've never taken out... Cons cons uh, uh, you could uh, Canadians, be deported. Pardon? You could be deported. Oh, I could be any time, yes. And I've always stood out publicly for that knowledge. I'm, there's no secret about that. And Canada has uh, left me alone largely because they know that my reasoning and my philosophy is sound and I only tell the truth. I'm a fluid druid. That is required of me and taught deeply into me. So I'm speaking now from not only a material and political but a spiritual view. I don't know how many people know, but I personally did civil disobedience and went to the Supreme Court of Canada under my own steam, doing my own law as a common man in 1978. I didn't know, I also did three months in Ocala because I said this law, this law is utterly ridiculous and against the will of God. Now all of that sounded ridiculous, but in a court of law, that the, the, the will of God is really a predominant aspect. Without that sense that we're all under one creative force, common law and all law would have no purpose. I'm speaking now, Mr. Conroy, and this is leading up to a question. The, the question is simply this. Are you conscious and aware of the fact that this country now is celebrating a republic in addition to the fraudulent monarchistic domination which is in the old line of empire going back to Babylon? That in fact the people of Canada are standing on a new wave of development and understanding and witness to the truth that we've been waiting for many and working for many years. I should say in my own defense I did keep my mouth shut here in Canada be for 12 years before I blew the whistle to the Governor General and the RCMP. I've recently, in fact over the years, been poking the RCMP to act on this current fraud, which was the failure of the, can of the trust when the cabinet under Mr. Trudeau and, and the Deputy Commissioner at that, uh, at that time was a Please, this is important to Mr. Conroy, I hope. You're going to have to get to the point, uh, though, my friends. Well, the point is, my friends, that we have to recognize at this time that there are major changes underway and where the marijuana movement puts its energy, whether into a destructive, adversarial, pointless party system to have a none right. of the above, excuse me, to have a none of the above on the ballot as a reasonable option or to join a republic already established in this country and move back to common law with no statute law to begin with. Do you have with. a question, John? Yes, sir. I disagree. Is, do you agree or not? Uh, no, I don't agree with you. Uh, I probably not. Practice <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I've been practicing law since uh, uh, 1972, 
And uh, when I started practicing, all we had was the Canadian Bill of Rights, and it was a, yes, a statute uh, that didn't have constitutional authority. Yes. And I fought umpteen cases uh, in the courts over all those years, arguing the Canadian Bill of Rights, mostly on behalf of prisoners. And, um, you know, uh, we argued till we were blue in the face, and because we were stuck with the common law, uh, which didn't protect us well enough on its own, uh, we didn't get very far. And exactly. so we lobbied That's and lobbied uh, to get a constitutional uh, democracy, to overcome and get away from what the Brits democracy. still have to some extent and, and called the parliamentary law. democracy. Well, in 1982, uh, don't interrupt me, please. Uh, well, you know, step we, back we into my question. John, we gave you your me. question. Come so on. You did. Hey, you've given your question. Sit down now, please, John. Thank you. Excuse me, Master. My enthusiasm and spirit overcame me. Well, do you know the difference between a constitutional democracy and a parliamentary democracy? You bits are still stuck in the old parliamentary democracy. You've got to get out of and join the constitutional democracy, and then you have a charter of rights and freedoms that is the highest and supreme law of the land, and that all of the politicians and God is subject to. We have something called freedom of religion in this country, and it's a charter right. God doesn't rule the courts, but it's one of the fundamental freedoms that exists, and lots of people have different opinions about different religions, and we try to be reasonable and accommodate them all. That's what a constitutional democracy is, my okay, friend. Okay, John, thank you. You've had your question. Thank you. That, John, no, we, no more. You've asked your question. That's it, my friend. You please sit down. I, that's okay. We can. I'll have you on the show later. Well, you can talk to him in private. This is my show, and if you don't like it, you can leave, my friend. No, I'm sorry. You have to sit down now, or we're gonna have you removed. <laughs> John, leave us alone, please. Thank you. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Yeah. Security. <laughs> I'm just teasing. How many don't want me to sit down? We all want you to sit down, John. Anyways. Oh, yes. It's a very vibrant pot community. Thank you, John, for your question. We appreciate it. But that's enough. Thank you. All right. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Well, so now back to this particular case. <laughs> thank you. Where were we? Yeah, exactly. Where were we? Well, we were actually, we were talking, I was asking you a bit about some of the witnesses we had. We had Garrison, who was bringing up certain things. And, oh, he's, <laughs> and so anyways, to rebut Garris, we had Tim Moen, who is the Fort McMurray fire chief. And I thought he did a really great job. Um, there were also um, Scott Wilkins, who came in from our side as well, an insurance agent. Um, can you talk about a little bit wh of why they were there and what they were there to do? Well, I think, again, um, you have to understand it, it, it's a special procedure that we followed here where uh, it's not like a regular trial where you'd hear the witnesses in chief and then cross-examination and re-examination. It's called a simplified procedure in the federal court. So our evidence, the evidence in chief was affidavits, sworn affidavits, and on the fact witnesses, the non-expert witnesses, we didn't get to lead them through their evidence and sort of expand upon it and so on because of something that happened the day before, that sort of thing. You're stuck with what's in that affidavit, and the other side, the government in this case, gets up to cross-examine on it, and we get a re-exam. So uh, we filed the plaintiff's affidavits, which set out the basic uh, facts from each of them, and they were cross-examined on them, except, unfortunately, T Tanya Beamish, but Dave Hebert, her spouse and caregiver, uh, uh, appeared for her. Then we also had the evidence of uh, Tom Bauman, Professor Tom Bauman from uh, the University of Fraser Valley. Now, none of you heard his evidence, because it's an affidavit. If you go online to the web page, you can read it there. But he was basically talking about natural health care products and what you can buy and so on and so forth and how you can grow them indoors, outdoors, greenhouses, showing the base that people can grow plants under these circumstances, anticipating to some extent what they were going to say. And so we then had Ramo uh, Colasanti to show us uh, how uh, you can do it with cannabis and you can do it in a, anything from a bloom box all the way up to a special room to show specifically that this can be done safely and securely in terms of fire, mold, all these issues. 
uh, anticipating again what we knew was to come because of the injunction proceedings. And then we had David Pate, Dr. Pate, in terms of the whole extracts question and to give some uh, a further background to the to whole situation. And we had Zachary Walsh, Professor Walsh from uh, UBC, to uh, show what the demographics are of the medically approved uh, patients and how many of them are on disability pensions. So that was presenting the plaintiff's case in, in, in order to show the, the basic uh, situation. And so what happened uh, as a result of that, now let me think, am I forgetting? I think uh, St uh, Eric Nash, was also one of our plaintiff uh, experts, right. uh, not non-experts, uh, and Eric was, was the witness today. And so a person like Ramo, but uh, who's, who's testified often in court and who got into this uh, business in a whole different way than, than Ramo, um, and uh, who gave similar evidence in terms of his experience uh, in terms of medical grows that he's been in. And then we also had... Um, uh, a number of other witnesses, and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to remember now if all of them were plaintiffs' witnesses. But anyway, well, I have the list as of a here, result, actually, John. well, those are who were called, you see. Right. And what oh, I'm trying I, to remember is the all the ones who weren't called. Yeah. And so we, uh, the government filed in response to our affidavits, 13 expert witnesses. If you remember at the injunction, there were only two or three, I think. And so. There were suddenly 13 witnesses, and it included uh, Professor Miller on mold, uh, Dr. Daining on uh, dosages and things of that kind, uh, 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 Larry Dybvig to do with real estate uh, devaluations, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Mahmoud Al Soli <coughs> from the Mississippi Potency Project. Paul um, Armentano, there was an uh, I don't know, wait, that, that's, that's one of ours. Oh, I see, you're going um, to yes. And so, the, Al Soli, Harold Kalant, um, I may be forgetting a few, but there's, there's 13 of them. Right. And so, uh, the uh, question then was, well, what do we do? And under this procedure, you can file rebuttal experts. So we then scrambled and got people to rebut their uh, evidence. And so we got not only uh, Tim Moon, who they decided to cross-examine on the fire thing, but there was also Robert Wallow, uh, an electrician and fire person. And they, yeah. didn't, uh, cho they chose not to cross-examine him. Right. And so uh, Jason Shute, uh, a mold expert from uh, Abbotsford, the mold man, uh, they chose not to cross-examine him. And he's the one who said in rebuttal to Dr. Miller, look, you, for a couple hundred bucks, you can get a humidistat and a proper dehumidifier, and it'll kick on when the moisture is too high and kick off when it yeah. isn't. So Mold that there are solutions, controlled. there are remedial uh, ways of dealing with these issues they've raised, fire, electrical safety, mold. Now, so, you know, a big po po point of the whole exercise here is to emphasize getting permits, making sure it's safe, not, you know, taking care for your neighbor, you don't want to have a fire, you don't want to burn the place down, you don't want to stink them out, all these sorts of things, because you're legal. But hopefully, privacy and confidentiality. But anyway, I, I digress back to what we were talking before. Right. So, we filed Paul Armentano uh, to rebut Mailer and Mikos. They called Mikos the law professor, so it was on U.S. law. Uh, we didn't call any rebuttals to the Netherlands and Israel. We cross-examined them. Yes. Uh, we did call, uh, present rebuttals Susan Boyd to Garris and Holmquist in terms of the media, her book, Killer Weed. We uh, uh, introduced Rob Connell-Clark and uh, Mark Merlin, or Rob as the, as the witness from Amsterdam, and his book, uh, Cannabis Ethnobotany, which had a whole section on medical marijuana and all, everything you ever want to know about cannabis going back to year zero <laughs> is in that book. And then we were lucky, too, to get the recent uh, Dr. Pertwee's handbook on cannabis, which is uh, edited the most up-to-date book on medical marijuana of great use to any physicians, people involved in, in the field as to what's accepted, what's coming on stream, all of that. It's an excellent book. Mm -hmm. So we were able John, to get all of that the top, in. Top part of your mic. We were all able to get all of that in to the uh, uh, evidence in rebuttal. And so the whole then, uh, they decided that they didn't want to cross-examine a number of our uh, rebuttal experts. 
And so we said, well, if you're not going to cross exam or call, or call rebuttal or cross examine them, we filed our rebuttals to yours, so we don't need to cross examine yours. Uh, it's just going to, you know, go on and on. Right. We've already filed our rebuttal, and, and we we're trying to fit everything into this three week period. So. Bear in mind, there's all that evidence out there that's online, on the web page, that wasn't called, that not only the witnesses that were called, all their in chief, but all of the rebuttals. And uh, so they chose to cross-examine Tim Moon, uh, uh, Scott Wilkin, the insurance agent, you know, showing that as far as uh, Lloyd's of London is concerned, the risk is, is manageable in terms of uh, insurance. And as he pointed out, you don't insure wanting to lose and have a loss. You insure hoping to make a profit. So, you know, I, I think that our evidence is, is, is good on all those issues. And as I say, I think they're all Section 1 issues anyway, not uh, Section 7 issues, which is the manner of how the government has done this. Uh, but uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to persuade uh, Judge Phelan that... Uh, that they can't demonstrably justify uh, reasonable limits on those bases. Uh, and, and I guess the one we haven't really touched on, I mean, they talked about kids and candies and all those sorts of things, but there just wasn't any evidence to really support that that's a significant risk. It's really a question of parents making sure they mind for their kids. But public safety. And this one uh, would have been way bigger for them uh, five years ago than it is today. And again, why? Washington State, Colorado, Alaska, Oregon, and so on. 33 medical states we heard, not just 23, which you usually hear. 33. As we were in these three weeks, all kinds of new things happening in the United States. A Senate, a Republican group in the Senate introducing a bill. Now again, this is kind of like the Canadian Chiefs of Police and the Conservatives trying to do something that'll stop people from going further. So always be alive to that's what's really going on there. Missouri, yesterday I think, introduced four bills. So there's all kinds of, uh, I think there's something like 75 states that have something pending. So the role is in the correct direction, um, and that impacts uh, public safety in this country. Why? I've been practicing criminal law for 40 plus years. A huge part of my practice used to be defending people charged with producing cannabis. I hardly have anybody charged with that anymore. It's all a variation often on a medical issue. Um, and why? Because 80% of the market for Canadian uh, produced cannabis was the US. It was only 5% of their market. Most of theirs is grown by Americans in America for America or comes through the Mexican border. And so the market collapsed. You can't sell the stuff into the US the way they used to. And so there used to be lots of cases of I was dealing with Seattle attorneys all the time <laughs> for Canadians they were trying to represent or, you know, people back and forth on treaties and all that sort of thing. And so the market has changed. Um, sure, there's still a gray market. Sure, there's still a black market. But, uh, you know, we'd hear from even police experts how the price had plummeted and then come back up a bit and so on. I mean, there's still dispensaries. There's still compassion clubs. There's, all of that still exists, but it's not what it used to be. And that, in turn, uh, reduces the risk of grow rips and uh, diversion issues and those sorts of things. And so it plays to this business about it being a control drug and the public safety issue. I mean, people out there are still in fear that the organized crime is going to come into the grow up next door that they can smell and these sorts of things. And we have a lot of work to do to tell people that they don't need to have those fears, you know. If you look at Holland, uh, you say to yourself, well, there's so much cannabis around, or at least there used to be. Uh, you know, if there's a glut in the market, there's no need. Uh, it's only very, very stupid people who will break into a medical grow up that knows they have security and cameras and so on in order to try and uh, cut down a, a fresh uh, plant, or unless they know it's already been dried or something, and then try to sell it into a, what's become a virtually non-existent market out there. 
So hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, take advantage of that compared to, as I say, what it was only f about five years ago. John, this, the, oh, Corey, do you have a question? Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if the last uh, witness, Eric Nash, if his uh, testimony is in question whether or not it's going to be uh, thrown out or approved. I was wondering if there's a question about him having a certificate and being considered an expert witness or not. You mean that he was an advocate? Was there some kind of question as to whether or not his testimony was credible and whether he was an well, expert? Well, I mean, every witness, every witness who takes the stand, their credibility is always in question. Mm -hmm. uh, this rises more with the fact witnesses than it does with uh, expert witnesses. Uh, they didn't want to cross-examine on his fact affidavit, which was all about uh, him trying to become a licensed producer and his experience in that regard. Um, and so the part they did cross-examine him on was the expert part. And the expert part, he was uh, put forward as an expert grower mm -hmm. uh, and as a person who is familiar with growing because of uh, having been a DG and, and his wife having been a DG over a period of time and interestingly enough having a, had a, a little uh, loop a hole in the transition where he was able to grow for five at one point and until it came down to four. But, uh, and, and Eric, you know, he's been involved with Health Canada obviously over many, many meetings and years and uh, has grown a lot of uh, cannabis and seen uh, not only a lot of medical grows, but if you looked at his CV, that whole long list of uh, cases were all criminal cases. And while his testimony was about yields and things like that, that's when he got to have a look at what the illegal grows were like. And so that's the comparison that he was making. So, uh, I mean, you know, they tried to, I mean, they went through his curriculum vitae in order to show that this was just based on his experience and that he hadn't gone through all 16,000 grows in, in uh, BC. But, um, you know, the Crown, uh, the defendant Canada may well uh, make a submission in, in their arguments, uh, written and, and oral, that. Uh, that he shouldn't be accepted, or that only part of his evidence, and we can do that with, with every witness. You know, the whole idea is it's up to Justice Phelan as the independent adjudicator to, he's heard both sides, he's read both sides, he's heard some of them that have been cross-examined, he hasn't seen, some of them were unchallenged, so we'll get to argue, hey, they're unchallenged. And so, you know, we have to put that together now and say, Judge Phelan, here are the facts. We want you to find these facts. And the other side will argue, we want you to find those facts. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, but it's all going to have to arise from the record of proceedings. And uh, so there's a huge amount of paper <laughs> that's gone through this proceeding and lots more to come. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think uh, Eric's credibility or uh, uh, his role uh, was undermined. I think he okay. gave pretty straightforward evidence about his experience in, uh, in growing and in uh, what he saw in medical growth. So, uh, uh, but we'll see what the government argues. Okay, um, I have one other uh, question about um, evidence that was submitted like regarding how the uh, competitions are done. Do you think there's any way that they're gonna hold that kind of evidence against anybody? Uh, comp uh, competitions, you mean like the Cannabis Cup, mm -hmm. stuff like that? No, yeah. I don't think so. Just curious. I mean, that, that evidence is, um, uh, you know, now I think about it, I should have gone on, uh, made some, asked some questions of Miss Sandvoss about uh, the Cannabis Cup, uh, <laughs> which they held in Amsterdam for yes, yes. I don't know how many years. There was a good article by Keith Strope, who's the uh, now <laughs> legal counsel to Normal USA. He was their executive director for years. And he talks about how things have changed in Amsterdam uh, to the point where at the last Cannabis Cup, the mayor tried to shut it down. And uh, people were, you know, running. I mean, it still went ahead. But that the whole administration in Amsterdam and the in Netherlands has become much more uh, uh, anti-marijuana than it uh, used to be. And yet uh, they make huge amounts of money, uh, especially in Amsterdam in the coffee shops. Um, I know on the Belgian border, uh, uh, because I have Belgian relatives, the Maastricht, uh, they've shut down the, the coffee shops, uh, uh, won't let any foreigners in there, they, they enforce that rule. And so it's changed from what it was, 
but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, I think economics will ultimately continue to drive the situation and the people will see that, uh, you know, this is uh, a place where you can still go. And, 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 and uh, you know, for all these years, um, there doesn't seem to have been any major, major problems that have arisen as a result. So, um, I where are the bodies? That. I'm sorry? Where are the bodies? Where are the bodies? Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's right. Actually, yeah. Um, John, I wanted to ask you about something that came up during the whole procedure, and this, this is the issue. We had um, Catherine Sandvos on from the Netherlands. She was talking about the program there. Now, um, something that came up was this whole idea of growing five plants in the Netherlands yeah. and whether or not that's actually allowed and how that's handled. It seems to be tolerated in some cases, but it's not actually legal. Um, we, all of us have had a hard time kind of nailing down exactly what, those, what the actual laws in the Netherlands were around that, those five plants themselves. Do you know any more about that? I, or is I, that was, I was a bit surprised that uh, Ms. Sandvos wasn't uh, more informed about what happened in the past. Um, and she, f you know, f focused uh, obviously based on her experience, which was more 2003 onwards. And uh, because um, the, the Netherlands has always had this uh, tolerance uh, attitude, it was it's like a government policy, which the the new crop of uh, government aren't that happy with. But it existed in in the, in the Netherlands for many many years, and it's a harm reduction approach. And the whole idea was that you reduce the hard drug uh, situation by doing this and you know, keeping the marijuana smokers away from the, and so on. And so the, the, the non-enforcement policy in relation to the coffee shops uh, was also in relation to the ability to grow. And it was the five plant thing. And so in the old days, it was not much of a problem, but it's got stricter and stricter and this, not all of this is in the evidence in the case. Uh, and, and the judge w w decided he, you know, he expressed the view that uh, he didn't need to know of the problems with it particularly because really the Crown or the government was simply introducing this to show what the, the Netherlands uh, uh, situation was. But um, my understanding, and again, there's a, a, a very recent uh, Newsweek, would you believe it or not, I just was given it the other night, it's got a big marijuana leaf on the front with uh, uh, the United States logo, <coughs> it's got a, a chapter on Amsterdam, and it explains uh, what uh, the author of, of that article is saying, that it's got a lot stricter, that um, if you use tents or any equipment, they'll say it's professional, uh, and certainly if they find you, they take away your plants and destroy them. Um, and so what's outdoor? happening is they're doing outdoor, and so I'm scratching my head a bit because surely that's more visible, but they seem to be, if you do five or less plants outdoor, and, and I got an email saying that you'll only grow um, uh, uh, one crop a year in those circumstances, uh, given the temperatures and climates and so on, uh, but they leave that alone. So I'm, I'm, that's what I'm hearing. I don't know for sure exactly how that's working, but at the same time, uh, I think the, the evidence is that uh, in the Netherlands, um, there was, uh, you know, people would just go to the coffee shops for years. And then they uh, started a medical program, and what I was told, and Ms. Sandvos, I don't think, uh, knew this or didn't... Uh, Although she accepted that there are the cases that have gone through the courts there where the, in, in the case of Ms. Worley, uh, she gets 500 euros a month to enable her to grow uh, medicine for herself because the Bedrocan stuff doesn't work for her. And there was a Mr. Hillebrand in the same situation. And there was one person prosecuted uh, criminally, Mr. Morlag, who, uh, sure, he was growing, but for medical purposes, and the court said, so we're not going to punish you. So... We know that in the Netherlands, if you're poor uh, and you meet certain criteria, there is a, a way for it to be dealt with. We know that you can grow five plants of your own if you want to. And the evidence in our case is that if you've got the appropriate space and everything, you can produce as much as 500 plants worth of cannabis if, if you know what you're doing. So, and, and then on top of that, they have a medical program. Uh, now, it's a bit still unclear to me, uh, but it sounded like some private insurers would cover uh, and some won't. 
Uh, and my understanding is, is that if it's the Bedrocan product, they'll cover it, but it's if any other product, they won't. Um, but at the same time, and, and this is again not in the evidence, uh, there was some information about different types of prescriptions that you, you can get a different prescription, but it's, uh, it's not easy to do. So, <coughs> well, uh, they, that was interesting because we heard there were other suppliers and then they ended up with only Bedrocan and they, the evidence seemed to be that Bedrocan was the only one who pa not only passed the screening and everything, but that others didn't apply. And uh, uh, so, um, but, but the interesting thing I thought was that if they were estimating 10,000 and, and the, the community was telling us 10 to 15,000 existed, and then it plummeted to 1,200 or 600 to start, and it's come up to 1,200, uh, you know, it seems to me the obvious inference is where did they all go? Uh, they must have gone back to the coffee shops or they're growing their own or they've left the country. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, that, that's the inference that I would draw. Uh, but they, they had uh, some interesting explanations in terms of why they only focus on one strain, or not one strain, five strains, uh, uh, and, uh, and that limited number because of the growing issues and so on. And I found that interesting to compare to uh, the licensed producers, some of whom say they can produce 65 strains. You're going to need a lot of uh, space and so on if the evidence uh, from the Netherlands is correct that you need a separate room for each, each one. I don't know enough about that, but I found that interesting because I, I wondered about how the patients who sold their strains or their plants to the licensed producers in the transition model, how that would work. You know, would they have a separate room for your strain? That seems to be awfully uh, expensive uh, proposition, but... <laughs> John? <laughs> anyway. I, I just wanted to clarify that it sounded like what she was saying was that if you had lights and you prepared your soil and you selected genetics and these sort of things, they would c consider you a professional grower, even if you what? only had five plants. And they were more likely to charge you if you had a kind of professional setup or... Well, I mean, when I first heard that the guideline that the police follow was, are you a professional grower not, my assumption was, is that, are you in it for the purpose of trafficking or are you in it for yourself? And uh, yet, we're being told that now if you do use equipment and lights and so on, uh, you know, it's anything too fancy, because they have a discretion, they'll say it's professional, but in any event, whether it's professional or not, they'll take your plants. Yeah. If it's professional, they might charge you. Although, again, my experience in, in Holland and the, and the Netherlands is that uh, at least they used to be a very progressive uh, bunch of people. <laughs> Hi, John. Um, big fan of yours. Love your work. You know, keep up the good work. You rock. Um, my question is uh, about if you're a grower under the current thing previously we could not change our addresses. Can we change our addresses at this time for our grow ops? No, you can't. Wonderful. Well, that's great news. Uh, thank you, and again, well, keep up the good work. You know, you're the awesome. The reason you can't change your, uh, your site, unfortunately, is that at the time of the injunction, uh, Justice Manson was persuaded that uh, he shouldn't intrude into the legislative sphere more than necessary. And so he, he picked certain dates in order to uh, grandfather uh, certain people. And we were critical of that and tried, uh, uh, I mean, the, the government appealed the injunction and we cross appealed. And we tried to persuade the court that that didn't, that the March 21 date didn't make sense, that you needed to think of it as an annual renewal. So if anything, it should have gone back a year. But the ATP issue, the authorization to possess, wasn't the most important because we say people can always go and get a Section 53 under the Narcotic Control Act. So it was the, pup, uh, the production by yourself or a DG and having to change the site that became the, the real issue. And that was precisely the case for uh, Tanya Beamish, the plaintiff, and Dave Hebert. And so we argued that uh, they, in their circumstances, should have been able to change their site. Um, unfortunately, the Court of Appeal first found that Justice Manson hadn't explained himself fully on that point, sent it back to him, 
And he uh, uh, said, no, that's what he meant. And so we are in the process of appealing that to get back in front of the Court of Appeal to say, okay, well, you know, he found uh, that it was a serious question to be tried. He found that the applicants, all of them, including Beamish and Hebert, were suffering irreparable harm. And yet he failed to give them a remedy, but he did give the remedy to some others. So he balanced, we, we will have to argue that in addressing the balance of convenience, you know, uh, not intruding into the legislative sphere, which was the basis for it, uh, isn't a proper thing to, to take into account in the circumstances when you're balancing constitutional rights of patients uh, against uh, a legislative scheme that is primarily designed to uh, create a licensed producer market. So they're balancing those two. So that's, that's our argument. Unfortunately, um, the law is at the moment that you can't change your site. And there are people who <coughs> fell between the cracks before the injunction uh, or, or under the dates and some who were grandfathered and then have had to uh, move their sites since. Uh, many through no fault of their own. Uh, some as a result of that uh, Health Canada letter in, back in November of 2013. And again, problems of stigma and, you know, people's attitude towards uh, uh, cannabis. So hopefully we will get this issue resolved. Um, we're thinking, in, you know, depending upon the appeal issue, we're trying to think of other ways that we might be able to try and persuade maybe the, the, the trial judge. But uh, it's too early to sort of deal with that at the moment. But we're very conscious of the fact that uh, there are a lot of people out there who are unable to change their production sites, and uh, it's, a, it's a problem, and hopefully we can come up with, or get the courts to come up with a solution, uh, you know, instead of having to wait until the ultimate decision of Justice Phelan after the trial. Because there will probably be appeals, and then there's always going to be questions of what stays in place pending the appeal. <coughs> you know? There's always these sorts of issues that come up. We will certainly argue that uh, everything, at least that is in place in the injunction, is in place until Justice Phelan gives a decision. And if his decision is in our favor and the government appeals, they will try and stay his decision probably, and we will oppose that stay in order that the exemption or terms of the injunction continue. Uh, and, and that it's at those periods of time that we may get an opportunity to seek expansion because of the evidence or the findings of the court. So it's all to be seen in the future. That's right. John. Yeah, thanks, man. So I had a question for you because Remo was in the court and Remo brought with him what's known as a bloom box. And we had the bloom box set up and it was actually you know, glowing in court and everything. And the bloom box has come up repeatedly over and over and over again. Oh, thank you. What is that, coffee? Oh, yeah. So the bloom box keeps coming up. So why, what is with the bloom box? Why is this coming up so much? And wh where does this fit into the whole scheme of things? Well, um, it, when you say that uh, people who grow marijuana or cannabis in their uh, apartments, in their condos, in small spaces, uh, and that it creates risks of fire, or mold, public safety, smell. Nowadays, there's all this equipment that exists that enables one to do it safely, that addresses fire, mold, pu even public safety. Uh, so, <coughs> Mr. Colosanti's evidence and Mr. Nash's to some extent, uh, and the exhibits uh, attached, which like the planet, the Green Planet catalog and things like that, to show what exists out there in order to do things safely. Flame defenders, these things, so that if there's any rise in heat and all these other concerns, things are immediately shut down, things are immediately dampered. Uh, the different uh, dehumidifiers and so on. And so here you have in the bloom box, and we heard uh, in Eric Nash's evidence today, of even smaller versions. Uh, and so obviously, these devices are the types of devices that if you're gonna do it in an apartment or a condo in a small space, it's just like plugging in a dryer, a little bit more complicated, I understand, but close to that. And so, um, 
what you're doing is it's relatively inexpensive and it takes care of all of these potential problems. And most importantly, you're not going to stink out your neighbors or, or create a risk of fire to them or a risk of a problem to them. And so it just illustrated, we call that evidence to illustrate that you can do something in a small box, in a small space, right up to a room such as Remo Colasanti's room, which is you know, designed to be uh, at the top end of the types of rooms, where you have air conditioning systems, where uh, he has no water coming into his, he testified, uh, I found that interesting, no water coming into his room at all. He just uses the water in the air conditioners, and he knows the, that sort of gives him the timing in terms of the watering as well. Uh, and his air conditioner system, so he's in a residential area. Um, but nobody knows about his situation because of smell. I'm sure there's neighbors that he's talked to, but, but he knows how to, uh, and he demonstrated how you can do this and not impact your neighbors. And so again, it's all about doing it safely and securely, addressing these potential issues, uh, admitting that they exist uh, in everything <laughs> out there, in the food and so on, uh, and that you know there are tolerable limits, but we all have to try and uh, worry about our neighbors and, and uh, do things safely. So the boom box, that's the the idea, so that people could see what's available out there. Uh, you know, and not just for for cannabis. You could use it for uh, all sorts of things, and uh, there's certainly a new trend towards people growing their own food. Basically, it, it shows that there's a very safe, effective way to grow inside your home that doesn't cause any problems, doesn't cause it, basically offend anyone. That's right. And relatively inexpensive. Uh, you know, Eric Nash testified today that you could do things for one to two thousand, and you know, the government cross-examined him, and so you could add on a few costs, especially your labor costs, if, if, uh, but most of us aren't going to add those on if we're doing it for ourselves. <laughs> Um, and so uh, you can do it inexpensively or you can do it expensively. It depends upon, obviously, your ability to do so and finances available. So, John, now we're coming back. The, you, you have to submit a bunch of documents, but we'll be actually back in court on April 30th. And what happens then? So this is the closing arguments then, and you guys kind of put it all together. What, what do you have we're, to do? We're going to put it all together in writing uh, by April 7th, so Easter Monday, I think that is. And um, then the government will reply to that by the following week. Uh, so they'll have obviously been working on theirs before they get ours, but once they get ours, then they'll refocus it to address ours, but also obviously they'll make their argument about the Section 7 issue and they'll make their argument about the Section 1 issue. Um, so we'll then see what their argument is and we'll have another week to look at that and to reply specifically to any points that they have brought up that we didn't in chief or, or whatever. So much the same sort of process in terms of we put in our arguments, they respond, we get a reply and then uh, the judge wanted oral argument so that we'll all get up probably on the April 30th. We'll be, uh, as plaintiffs, uh, taking the judge through our arguments or making an oral presentation of our arguments. Uh, it won't be a reading uh, of the documents that we've filed. It will be an oral argument. And then uh, they will get up, or somebody on behalf of the defendants, Mr. Brongers or one of the uh, defendant lawyers will get up and make the argument on behalf, or they might divide it up as we might. Um, so that uh, we then reply after their arguments and then it's in the hands of Justice Phelan. He will take that all away and all of the huge amounts of material that he's already had to consider and he's it. He's uh, the person who's going to have to go and apply these legal rules and the law and see how these facts and the evidence fits within that legal framework and come up with a decision. And uh, so he's the one who has this enormous task of weighing all of the evidence, deciding what to accept, what not to accept, applying the onuses of proof, deciding who's succeeded or not. On the, uh, and, and, and he's the independent adjudicator. And that's how, uh, how it works. And hopefully we'll be able to persuade him 
Uh, you can expect the government will do everything they can to persuade him the other way, and he'll make the decision. Well, John, thank you so much. I'm, is there anything else that uh, you'd like to add, or is there anything that, you know, I know that there's basically a lot of work that you have to do right now. Is there anything that anybody else can do for you right now? Um, well, I don't know right at the moment, other than continuing to fundraise to help us, uh, you know, continue to raise funds to pay for all the work that has been done. The community's been doing a great job, uh, but it's a huge case and taking up way more time than... Uh, we thought, and uh, it's going to go on, <laughs> and there's still lots more to do. So the more we can raise, the better, um, and so we really appreciate what you've been able to do so far and hope that we'll be able to continue. But also, there's another uh, uh, thing, and that is uh, next week, uh, the Smith case is in the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Smith case uh, is the extracts case. And so this is the first time the Supreme Court of Canada will hear a medical marijuana case. Uh, I was there back in, uh, there's David Malmo Levine over here, it was 2003, I think, when we got the decision in uh, Malmo Levine and Kane. And uh, that was a challenge to the prohibition against uh, cannabis, period, uh, not medical. And the court uh, ruled that we argued that the harm principle, the principle, uh, the John Stuart Mill uh, principle, that you can do whatever you want as long as you don't uh, present a significant risk of harm to others, should be the principle in terms of the use of the criminal law. You shouldn't use the criminal law, the big stick, uh, unless there's a risk of significant harm. They ruled that wasn't a principle of fundamental justice. Uh, they said it's a political question. The government can decide what levels of risk of harm and what to criminalize or not. Uh, but they did say something about how different it was in a medical situation because there'd be different factors that would apply. And so they refused to grant leave in Parker, in Myrna, uh, other medical cases. Uh, but Smith, uh, as most of you probably know, I'll just give you a recap quickly. Uh, Justice Johnson in the BC Supreme Court ruled that the limitation to dried marijuana only was unconstitutional, that that was a Section 7 violation, that it was too restrictive on the right to continue to grow. His remedy, however, was to strike out the word dried. And in the legal arguments, this, uh, the, the, the government, the Crown, was able to persuade our Court of Appeal on appeal that this is legislating, that that's something for government, not the court. And it's rare for the courts to do that. More often than not, in constitutional cases, the court finds it to be unconstitutional, strikes it down, and gives the government a certain period of time to fix it up. That's what happened in Terry Parker's case, and Terry Parker had an exemption pending when they, you know, they gave him finally a Section 56, and then the MMAR came in as their solution to that problem, and, and now the MMPR. So, <coughs> Smith goes to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal splits two to one. Two judges saying, yes, it's unconstitutional, and agreeing with Justice Johnson, but not agreeing with his remedy, and saying he shouldn't have struck out the word dried, he should have tossed the ball to government to fix it up, and gave them a year to do so. The dissenting judge, interestingly enough, he kind of thought that, hey, why, uh, if you look at the evidence of the MMAR, it said you could inhale or orally, uh, and so he said, look, once you've got your dried marijuana, what you do with it in terms of your consumption is up to you. And interestingly enough, uh, Ms. San, uh, who was it? Um, I think it might have been Ms. Sandvoss pointed out that in the Dutch system, uh, I asked her if you could make extracts, and she said yes. So uh, it's a similar thing to that, which is rather interesting. But so anyway, the Court of Appeal split two to one. And by splitting two to one in a criminal case, because it's a case against Owen Smith, the cookie maker for the, uh, uh, Ted Smith's uh, uh, situation in Victoria. So because there was a dissent, they have an automatic right of appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. It doesn't depend upon leave to appeal. So for the first time next week, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada will hear this case and will have to decide for the first time the medical marijuana issue. And that requires them to grapple 
with Section 7 of the Charter uh, in order to get to the extracts question. So that's why we argue there should be an adjournment of our case pending that, and we will probably argue to Judge Phelan uh, that he should await that decision, that we should hear from our highest court on the ambit and scope of Section 7 in a medical marijuana case and the ambit and rules under Section 1 in a medical marijuana case. Because clearly, the, we, we, we will argue that uh, the ambit and scope of the right includes the right to produce um, and the right to uh, consume in any way. And the onus shifts to government under Section 1 to try and limit that. They will argue that, uh, no, no, your, your Section 7 right only covers dried marijuana. Uh, because uh, presumably, well, I'm not exactly sure of what that evidence is in Mr. Smith's case, but because I think there were all sorts of cookies and all sorts of other things as well. So, next week, big case, Supreme Court of Canada, first time medical marijuana. You never know how long they're going to take before they make a decision. They've kind of rushed things a bit compared to normal in terms of it being heard. So, uh, Hopefully, they'll make a decision quickly, and hopefully, it'll be available to, to Justice Phelan. If, if they take a long time, obviously, he's going to have to make a decision at some point. I mean, he may decide that, no, it's in the best interests of everybody for him to make a quick decision. Uh, and and uh, then that the Supreme Court of Canada may take that into account. Now, they're obviously not going to take it into account next week. Uh, my understanding is there, there are some pending in other provinces. Uh, uh, there's certainly uh, uh, cases in other provinces, and even in this province, there's the Garber case of Kirk Tussauds that is a similar case to the one we've just done, but, but it's in B.C. Supreme Court as opposed to the federal court. The reason we're in the federal court is because a ruling from the federal court is binding across the country. If we'd gone simply to B.C. Supreme Court, like Smith... It's only binding in BC, which raises the interesting question of what's the current status of extracts. And it appears that the Court of Appeal, and this doesn't, I, I'm still having difficulty understanding how you can win in front of Justice Johnson and strike out the word dried, and then win in the Court of Appeal, but because they choose a different remedy, there's no continuing exemption pending the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. So, are extracts legal or not in BC? They were, at least until the Court of Appeal decision. Uh, there's certainly an argument that they're not anymore in BC. But they certainly didn't cover other provinces, although there are other cases, I understand, it working their way up to the courts in other provinces on this very issue. So, it's all partly because we're a federal uh, country and we have federal courts and provincial superior courts. And people have options to go to different courts, and uh, these rules apply. You can't have a judge in B.C. binding somebody in uh, Quebec or, or Ontario and so on. So uh, it's all part of the uh, justice system. So, John, there was a question from the chat, um, and I, I don't know how much you can really speculate on these things, but they wanted to know, yeah, they wanted to know if, um, if the judge came back and ordered the government to make new, new regulations for the MMPR that included home grows, they want to know, do you think that the government would appeal that? Well, I mean, the situation will simply be that the court may, of the options available to it, uh, if they ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, would then uh, order the, give the government a certain period of time to uh, amend the MMPR, the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations, to include uh, provisions for personal production and, and, again, if our arguments accepted, caregiver production. And so they'll be given a period of time to do that. And so uh, our experience has been in other cases that they will probably appeal and then seek a stay of that period rather than go and draft it. And we will argue it's not hard to draft because we've got some prior precedents from the MMAR. And, but we're certainly not saying put in all the MMAR stuff. We're saying, you know, you've got to create that. And then there's the 150-gram limit in the extracts issue as well, of course. So I would say, will the government appeal uh, instead of creating the legislation? Probably. Um, and so that then raises the question of 
what happens. Does the injunction continue uh, at pending appeal? You know, there'll be some arguments back and forth about what happens in the interim. And so the government presumably will have to weigh whether it wants that or does it simply want to create the new legislation or additions and then see if we uh, think that's adequate or not and have to start, we'd have to start a whole other uh, case to do that. So I would, you know, if history is uh, our guide, they're more likely to appeal, seek a stay of the uh, order pending appeal, and we'll uh, seek uh, terms in terms of the exemption to continue. And as I said earlier, that may give us an opportunity to uh, actually uh, try and convince the courts to uh, expand the injunction to cover all medically approved patients. So, John, we had a question about whether or not um, it, people could move who were grandfathered in under the old MMAR. Now, if somebody say, and you said no, that they couldn't, they'd be subject to, to prosecution. But if they did get busted and they did go to court, would that, I mean, would they simply wait for this case to be finished or would they continue on? We were having this discussion earlier. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say. You know, the interesting thing is they're still maintaining the database. So they know uh, existing licenses and their addresses. And the police still call and uh, if they're doing an investigation to see if it's legal or not. So that uh, if it's legal, well, you know, they're not going to get a warrant. If it's illegal, they probably will. And the problem has been, even with the Section 53, if your authorization to possess wasn't valid on March 21st, 2014, the date of Justice Manson's order, arguably, well, y y your ATP wasn't valid, so the possession part wasn't valid. And so when the police have been calling the database, the Health Canada person has been saying it's no longer valid, even though the PPL or the DG may still be valid. And so we've got two or three cases going on across the country, one in Edmonton, a couple in Saskatchewan, where they sent SWAT teams in on these people uh, who are medical, um, and they got 53s under the narcotic control regs, but obviously the 53 isn't registered in the database. And so I think what people should be doing is sending their Section 53s uh, because they're not changing their production site. They're just saying, look, my possession is also covered. They should send those uh, to uh, Health Canada uh, to the attention of the litigation support group. Um, and maybe we'll post a, a particular address and so on for people to do that. So we'll see uh, what they do in terms of the database uh, to that extent. But then there's also, uh, so there, the question arises in terms of uh, the change in, in production site. And uh, so, you know, at the moment you can't uh, do it. Uh, and so if you are busted because you're growing, but you are a medical patient, uh, you're medically approved, uh, the defense that you have to have in order to be found not guilty is something called medical necessity. You're going to have to establish that the evil, I put that in quotes, that you're committing by growing medicine for yourself is a lesser evil than the evil that would exist if you went without your medicine. Uh, and, and so it raises the Parker Section 7, Section 1 issue, again, being put in a position where you have to choose between your liberty and your health. Right. And, but the most important part of the medical necessity defense is you have to establish that there's no other lawful or reasonable way that you could have done this. And it, it, it may be, depending upon the individual circumstances of each patient, that if you were grandfathered uh, and then you lost your, your permit uh, or you had to move or these sorts of things, you're still medically approved, you still need your, your uh, medicine, your liberty's still going to be engaged potentially if you go and do it on your own, and your health's going to be engaged if you don't. Uh, do you have other alternatives? I mean, they may argue, well, you can go to a compassion club or, or, a, or a dispensary. That's true, you could, but they're not legal. It's other lawful ways to address the evils. And so there aren't any other lawful ways unless, I mean, they may argue that you can afford to go to an LP. So, you know, if you're a person who can't afford to go to an LP, medical necessity is not likely to work for you as a defense. But if you are a person who is on a disability pension, who can't afford to go to an LP, 
uh, medical necessity is your last line of defense, uh, in my opinion. Cool. So David Malmo Levine on the microphone has a question. John, did you notice uh, the uh, first day when the government lawyer, uh, in his opening statement, lied about the compassionate pricing? Uh, you say lied about the compassionate pricing? Yeah, he said that uh, there were buds available for $1.75 a gram, and I reviewed all 16 LPs, and it turns out the only thing available for $1.75 a gram is shake. I know, but I'm not sure that, I wouldn't call it a lie, David. I think that's uh, over the top. You know, when you're arguing about things, you uh, have to understand that sometimes people may not understand what shake is. And right. uh, we don't know if the government lawyer knows that. An if you go to the web page, it says $1.75. Well, it's, mo it's more accurate to say a, an inaccurate statement okay. from somebody who knows that what shake is. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, most of the web pages that we looked at, I, I think I agree with you, it was either trim or shake. That's uh, right. The and, cheapest bud was $5 a gram from the LPs. But, you know, I think the real important point is that the government has just tossed the ball to the LP, so-called free market, in order to ensure that all patients are covered. That's not good enough, we say. We say they have to ensure that there is provision for all medically approved patients. Do you notice they, That's what we say they failed to do. Well, I agree with you. Do you notice that they called it a free market in all their press releases, but they called it a captive market in court? Oh, no, I didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, <laughs> they said they wanted a captive market so that the LPs would have a chance at surviving. And that, was, that wasn't the first day. That was before when you got the injunction. So just making sure you knew. Okay. So, now, John, um, here, I'm just going to flip the cam back here. Got to eat it? Okay, I got it. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple things I wanted to ask you about just before we let you go. Um, one was today, and I, don't, I, I can't remember if we addressed this or not. I don't think we did. But today, something came up where there was to be more evidence entered into the in two things. Um, and the judge kind of shut you down on entering some more stuff. What was that about? Well, again, this, this is a special procedure, the specialized or simplified action, which we've all actually had a few jokes about. It's nothing, it isn't really simplified at all. It's uh, a bit more complicated to compare to what we're used to. And so, you know, if I'm in a criminal trial and uh, let's say it's a week long and I got something the night uh, before my cross on, uh, on something, I could use it. Uh, I just have to make sure I got enough copies. I don't have to have filed it in a book beforehand as to what I was going to put. And similarly here, we have to file those affidavits. And so... Um, you know, as a criminal defense lawyer, the way we, we think on our feet and expect things to be done when you're in the hurly-burly of a trial, uh, <coughs> obviously the government and these procedures uh, are that, oh, you have to file a motion and an affidavit in support and, uh, you know, a whole formal application. You can't just do it on your feet in the, in the course of the trial. And so that was their objection. Uh, all we wanted to do is we wanted to add some uh, materials uh, to Eric Nash's fact affidavit, not his expert affidavit, and they weren't going to cross-examine on his fact. So, you know, their complaint was that uh, we were really trying to amend and add evidence, uh, and nobody should be able to do it, and so on and so forth. And the judge uh, ruled uh, in their favor, saying that, uh, you know, if we'd had it a week which, uh, of course, was the week we're in the middle of the trial. But he ruled that, um, you know, we should have uh, done that. So um, it, it was really evidence to do with the ongoing uh, licensed producer situation in particular. Um, and <clears throat> it may be that we have to make a motion uh, at some point if we think it's important enough to, uh, to do that. But... Uh, it was simply some additional information that we wanted to get in about, you know, what's going on and, and how uh, this Office of Medical Cannabis uh, uh, is, is more than just uh, what's left of the old uh, program. It's, it's now the regulator, the office that regulates the, uh, the LPs under the MMPR and has a number of functions, apparently including the, 
monitoring of the uh, the, the police uh, line or the, the line that the police uh, use to check the database. Yeah, there was some interesting stuff there for sure too. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing that the judge kind of shut down at one point was after we, we had the chance to watch a video of Remo in action, um, which was a, quite a humorous video. It was an obviously fraudulent video, or Remo was joking around. It was entertainment, and he, uh, he had a giant male plant, and he was rolling it in a newspaper and taping it up with tape and then pretending to smoke it. And it seemed that the defense, the Crown defense, thought this was actually he was really doing this or this was some example of him using his medicine? Or was the, do you think they actually thought that or were they just you know, trying to um, do an ad hominem attack on Remo or something? I must confess I was a bit puzzled by that uh, because uh, it's, we thought it was obviously a joke. Uh, I was disappointed the Vancouver Sun wasn't there to see themselves being rolled up. Uh, <laughs> But um, I, 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 I don't think that uh, it had uh, much impact on, on Ramo's uh, evidence. You know, again, we'll wait and see what Justice Phelan's view of it was, but uh, um, he appeared to understand that it was uh, intended as humor. Uh, and the same with uh, Tim Moan's uh, 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 Libertarian oh, yeah. Party uh, uh, his meme documents. that had something about <laughs> protecting his marijuana grows with guns. Well, I was trying to, you know, the extreme view that many people have of libertarians. Uh, his statement was that uh, they believe that uh, uh, gay couples should be able to use guns to protect their grow-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so they were trying to... Uh, I, I, they did seem kind of surprised after the Remo video when they found out it was fake. Um, and then the judge... They had other videos they wanted to play as well. I guess there were a couple lined up or something. And then the judge just said that they weren't allowed to play that. Is that true? No, or no. It no, was just I don't the one? think so. I don't think oh, there was okay. any ruling. I think they just chose not to. Just uh, as oh, we had put okay. things in our binders that we were going to play, we were you know, maybe going to play the Gupta uh, videos, and we decided that it uh, wasn't really necessary to do it. Uh, we did play the prescribed grass one. Unfortunately, uh, this was in the Israeli uh, Israel uh, uh, evidence. Unfortunately, the disc was defective, so they didn't get to see the whole end of it. But uh, it, uh, it uh, I thought, was a very interesting uh, uh, video, and it really... Um, showed, you know, Ralph Machulam, Professor Machulam, who uh, is uh, responsible for uh, uh, determining the endocannabinoid system and uh, THC. Uh, he's still, uh, the, uh, as he said, he'd rather be called the father than the grandfather of it all. <laughs> but uh, he uh, is clearly, you know, what they've been doing in Israel uh, they don't want to be known as the Amsterdam of medical marijuana, but uh, uh, the fact is is that Israel is uh, far ahead uh, in terms of its research, in terms of uh, producing uh, high-quality cannabis and so on. And uh, very importantly, I thought, uh, you know, it's all come together from cooperatives and into a, a select number of growers, and they are not allowed to charge more than $100 a month. So, uh, well, no, it's, uh, there's ways and means of getting more than that, up to 200, uh, but you've got to go through a committee and have the support of your doctor. I think that's my recollection of the evidence. The, the 100, 200 gram thing has changed over time uh, when Dr. Baruch was in, in charge of the program. But, um, uh, so, uh, there is a, a, a provision for exemption uh, but it's no matter how much, it's only $100 a month. But you're right that most of it's under 100 grams. And, you know, so the, the government, I'm sure, will make much of that, that, you know, the whole business about you only need one to three grams. Um, and I think the answer is, well, if it's high-quality uh, stuff, then obviously you need less. And uh, isn't that really part of the extracts argument? <laughs> less smoking and more... Uh, powerful stuff so that people will consume less and smoke less uh, because the smoking isn't good for their health. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out in all these. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really quite fascinating. But so if anybody, you want to have a look at prescribed grass, it's called. It's on yes. the Internet. 
Uh, it shows you uh, how these things all changed. 1936, when it was uh, taken off the American Pharmacopeia, you know, at times when all these other things were going on in terms of uh, uh, alcohol and other, you know, from early 1900s right up until that period of time. It was on the British uh, Codex beyond that, I think, to 46. And so it, it showed the old pill bottles David Malma Levine, I think, used to have in the museum, you know, to show all of these tinctures and everything of cannabis that were available not so long ago historically. And how we've had this period which has created this huge uh, stigma uh, arising out of the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, maybe the 50s, it probably, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, we're now uh, into another period of uh, history in which hopefully we will be able to undo the uh, injustices and uh, get it back to uh, being legal and particularly available in its various forms for medical patients. I think that's one of the most interesting things is that in Israel it went from 86 or, or 68, I can't remember, to uh, 14,000. And he said, really, it was 20 or 28,000. About 8,000 people had died. And so, uh, talk about exponential growth, just like here in Canada, which is a major a point the government keeps making, is that we went from a few hundred to uh, 38,000. And so, exponential growth. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, it appears, went from, uh, uh, it became somewhere between 10 and 15,000, and then plummeted uh, as a result of the approach that they've taken. So, the, the and, and, and the prices in the, co in the coffee shops has apparently gone sky high, which would indicate to you that supply and demand <laughs> is at work here somewhere <laughs> affecting these things. So, uh, you know, when they talk about this artificial construct of it's not uh, shown to be safe, <clears throat> it's not shown to be effective, therefore it's not an approved drug, therefore it's not available on your insurance coverage and so on, uh, it's, a, it's an artificial construct that the law makes in order to become an approved drug. There is huge amounts of evidence of how safe it is uh, compared to nearly all the other drugs they have or that they use on a regular basis. Uh, and you think that the number of people who've now given testimonials about using it and getting off their other drugs in particular shows its efficacy. And so there's lots of evidence of that as well. So, you know, hopefully uh, it's only a matter of time before we can get rid of that uh, construct and, uh, and, and have people uh, accept it without all of this emotional, uh, reactive uh, type of stuff that we continue to see. Mm -hmm. Sandy, do you have a question? I have one quick question. Okay. Where What's do you think question? all the meat... Like, like you guys, I, I follow your media coverage, cannabis culture, Twitter, everything you guys were fabulous. Where was the mainstream media though? Where were they on this case? Like, do they not understand Ian it Mulgrew or get was, it? Ian Mulgrew was there the first day and uh, uh, wrote one article, and then he was off on that terrorist uh, trial. So right. right. So it just wasn't a big enough uh, Mike story. Mike Hagar was there from the Globe and Mail. Yeah, a Mike couple, was there. He was there a few days. A few days. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, you see the newspapers are in decline. Uh, yeah. It's all going digital. Yeah. Uh, while people of my generation might still read newspapers, I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to depend upon my son-in-law to tell me what was going on. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no. They were there in the first day, yeah. 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 And they yeah, may, I'm sure they, they'll be there for the decision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, John, I had a quick question about this whole idea of introducing as much evidence as possible related to marijuana or putting a lot of stuff in. It seems like there's the desire to get a lot of stuff on the record um, from, you know, related to marijuana. And I, and I know Remo was uh, interested in you know, what happens after when he, he talks about things that might incriminate him or something in court. I mean, what happens with this data? Why is it important to enter all this stuff in? Or is there a desire to enter some stuff in about us and what we're doing? Well, it's, it's all a matter of what are the issues in the case. And uh, 
uh, in this type of a situation, where are you going to get the evidence to show that you can grow something safely and securely except from somebody who's got the experience in doing it? And so while uh, the government has a number of you know, highly qualified professors and so on as part of their expert uh, witnesses, our view was it's the people who are hands-on who uh, deal with mold and remediate places or who do electrical work or who or fire people on the ground, you know, this sort of thing. We, we, our submission is that this is uh, practical uh, evidence. And so, uh, sure, we were able to, uh, to get Eric Nash uh, as well as, as Ramo, but uh, the important thing was to show uh, somebody with experience over so many years at doing it and being familiar with all the different types of things. I don't know where else we could have got that. Right. Uh, you know, we could have got somebody from one of the stores or from the industry, but they would have uh, been in a more awkward position in terms of uh, cross-examination than somebody like Ramo who's out there, he's on the... Uh, Internet, uh, he is what he is, and uh, his evidence is there, and there's nothing to hide. And uh, so, you know, uh, you know, under Section 13 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, any evidence you give uh, cannot be used in subsequent proceedings, except for uh, perjury-type proceedings. So, if they uh, determine that you're lying or fabricating your evidence or something like that, then certainly something can happen. But, uh, and it certainly provides maybe the police and others with intelligence information, but they're not going to be able to use the evidence you gave in the trial as a witness against you in any subsequent proceeding. Right, I see. So, so there's usefulness for some of this stuff outside of even this case itself. Well, you know, the important thing again will be whether uh, Justice Phelan decides to put it in the record. His findings of fact are the critical evidence. Uh, if you go back and you look at the findings of fact of, uh, of uh, the judge at trial in David Malma Levine's case, it was Judge Curtis, uh, or the facts as found in the Cain case uh, years ago in provincial court and upheld in BC Supreme Court and then both being heard together in the Court of Appeal and you look at the Clay case out of Ontario, and all those three cases were heard together in the Supreme Court of Canada. If you go and you read that decision, you'll see the findings of fact. And we put a lot of uh, what we call uh, legislative fact uh, evidence in, especially in that case, to show all of these royal commissions to, that have gone back to 1894, to show, you know, here's the big picture in terms of this plant, and here's the issue that's going on in relation to it in context so that uh, the whole story is there. And the findings of fact, if you go and look at, and we'll be arguing, that we, we don't, you know, there's no dispute in this case that uh, we're not re-arguing Parker. Um, it's accepted that there are medical uses and we're not having to relitigate that a patient is being put in a Section 7 situation of having to choose between their liberty and their health. Uh, so while there's a lot of evidence in there from Robert Clark, Dr. Pate, Dr. Calant, Dr. El Soli on both sides, uh, there's no real debate about that anymore. And, and so you can read Malmo Levine and Kane and you'll see the findings of fact uh, that, you know, uh, cannabis is a pretty benign substance. And the, all those findings are there. And, you know, the, the dangers are set out in that judgment too. And at that time, there were still some concerns about uh, certainly young people in certain specific situations. And, uh, you know, people, I think, uh, have to be candid that, you know, some people think it's a wonder drug, and, and uh, that's what term was used in the prescribed grass video that Dr. Baruch took issue with. And I agree with him. Uh, many people, if you're trying to persuade them of the benefits of cannabis, uh, you, you turn them off if you say it's a wonder drug. What you need to understand is that it's, it's not a cure, uh, but it's a symptom reliever, and that according to the medical evidence, it's a modulator and a regulator of whatever may be going on, and that's why it seems to help in a lot of different situations. Um, so it's uh, still a lot about communicating to the other members of the public uh, what this is all about and what's really going on, and uh, having them uh, see, you know, that this is uh, 
uh, something that is, is helpful and beneficial to, uh, to many, many people, and particularly in, in the medical area. And so, you know, that's the, the hope is to have enough information there to show historically what's been going on so that a proper fair decision can be made. One more thing, John, was um, the economist, uh, the, the far, I guess he is a pharmaceutical economist or some combination of those two things. Um, he was there to speak on the market itself and how large the market might be, these kinds of things. Now, he seemed to predict that there would be a very large market for the LPs, um, but it came up in cross-examination that he wasn't even aware of all the dispensaries in Vancouver and other sort of key points of the whole system. Um, why was he, why did the government bring him in and what was he really there for? And do you think he was effective? Well, you know, he testified, uh, although it was in question and answer, written question and answer form in terms of the injunction. And um, uh, my understanding is, is that the, the government is trying to show, or was trying to show, that the ability to continue to grow for yourself uh, or have a caregiver do so would interfere with that market. Would, uh, and, and they're wanting to develop that market and make it a viable market. And uh, I remember certainly at the time of the injunction that he accepted that the market is big enough and is going to happen uh, and that the only impact really of the uh, personal producers uh, or caregivers was that it would take a longer time for the market to develop. Uh, but it would still happen. And, but interestingly enough, he doesn't seem to have been advised or the whole aspect of the dispensaries and compassion clubs wasn't really clear uh, and certainly not in his, uh, in his uh, written reports. So because the sense that we have, and I'm not sure this is clearly in the record in the evidence either, but uh, the, the arguments and I think the inferences can be made that what seems to have happened is that the LPs have come on stream. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, having some problems. Uh, so what seems to have happened is uh, people who were stopped growing for themselves or having a caregiver do so have uh, now uh, maybe tried the LPs if they could afford them, but have gone back to the clubs. And so the clubs, while they were down for a period of time, have uh, apparently uh, are now thriving. <clears throat> I'm told there's over 66 clubs in Vancouver. I remember the days of uh, two. <laughs> so um, things have changed in that regard, and obviously that uh, will impact uh, the market. I mean, we, uh, and this is uh, separate from our court case, uh, you know, Normal Canada, other organizations seeking uh, legalization, uh, and on the medical end, we would say you should have the LPs uh, uh, producing uh, and meeting all of these requirements about medicine, uh, but having the dispensaries as the retail arm or the retail part, so that all of these rules about when you're selling to the public are met, um, but without preventing you from growing your own just like you can grow your own food. And that ultimately that's uh, where it should go. So because you have to expect if you're going to sell something to the public, um, you're going to have to meet, and, and call it medicine, uh, you're going to have to meet certain uh, rules and regulations. Uh, it is true we don't have to do it for food. Um, and you can even take food down to your local farmer's market. And, uh, but again, people wash the food. People don't want to eat food. And they'll look at it, you know. And I'm, it's, I'm sure it's the same with anything else. But uh, when you hold it out to be medicine, different rules come into play if you're selling it. And the same is true for natural health care products. If you're uh, growing and uh, uh, producing a natural health care product for sale to the public, there's a whole bunch of rules not that different to the MMPR that you have to follow. So that's a big distinction, doing something for yourself or you know, having a caregiver that stands in your shoes and is doing it for you as opposed to doing it to sell to the public as medicine. We have another audience question. All right, just a quick two-part question. Um, do you think the people that were forced under the uh, MMPR to sign up with LPs will be allowed to grow for themselves uh, once this case is decided? 
Well, it's hard to say. My understanding is, is that if you used your authorization to possess as the medical document and turned it into a licensed producer, they would take your original and you'd become registered with them and you wouldn't be able to get that back. Although there's some provision in the MMAR and, uh, that we thought the, the, the Health Canada uh, was still uh, going to provide people with replicas or copies if they lost them. Uh, I heard from one fellow about that, but I haven't heard back as to whether he was successful in getting a, a copy back from Health Canada. So my understanding at the moment is that you've turned it in, you don't have an authorization to possess anymore. And, you know, if your personal production license, if you still have that, and it was valid under the injunction, again, I say, well, you get a Section 53 to cover your possession. But um, your, your, your question really, I think, goes to what's going to happen in the future. And uh, it's hard to say because uh, it'll sort of be up to the government to decide how they legislate, and then we'll have to decide whether it's constitutional or not. But... Uh, you know, I would expect that, uh, that they will, uh, uh, if we're successful, they will uh, uh, again provide in legislation that a person can personally produce or hopefully have a caregiver do so for them or go to an LP. And so that that option uh, will become available. We, we say they should include the compassion clubs and dispensaries in the equation as well yeah. so that a patient can do any of those things, including going to a compassion club. And uh, do you expect um, the government to, uh, or sorry, the LP, like if we do win this, do you, ex do you expect the government to, or the LPs to sue like us, like for our tax dollars because they've been- to The LPs to do what? Like to sue us because they've misled under the program? Sue you for what? No, 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 like uh, the LPs would sue the government for our tax dollars because they've misled under the current program if we win? Is that a problem? Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure they have a, a cause of action. Uh, it's like, you know, all of the people who uh, have spent money creating their own uh, grows and so on, uh, their own production sites, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult legal question as to whether or not they could sue the government to recover those costs. Normally, you can't do that simply because the government changes its policy. You need to find some negligence or some, some what we call a tort, some sort of tortious conduct in order to, and to show you've suffered damages in order to sue for damages. So, I mean, I think there's a huge number, I'm told, of, of applicant LPs uh, who haven't been approved. There's at least one lawsuit, I think two I've heard of, um, uh, and there's rumors about class actions and other sorts of things because of how the LP application process has been handled and, and representations that have been made and so on. So well, the jury's not out in that whole scenario. We'll, we'll see what happens. But hopefully, uh, at some point, common sense, I hope, rules that we have those options available to people. So. And sorry, just last thing. Uh, is it health dollars being used to fight this case or is the Justice Department funding it? I have no idea. It's uh, your taxpayers' dollars, uh, yeah. whether it's Health Canada or Department of Justice. It's, uh, you know, uh, trying to uphold the, the government's uh, position. So is it possible if we win to injunct them to stop... I can't hear you. I, I can't hear you. A little, it, little louder. Is it possible if we win this to stop injunct them from using any more of our tax dollars? I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Yeah, hey guys, quiet down a little bit. We, wanna, we have a question here. We're trying to hear it. So if we do win the case, can we injunct them to stop using our tax dollars to fight the, like their side? Right. Hey, everybody in the room, just be quiet a sec and speak into the microphone, my friend. If we win this case, can we uh, injunct them to stop them using our tax dollars to f continue fighting? No. I mean, uh, you know, arguably they're not necessarily abusing your tax dollars. They're the government. They've passed legislation and they are lawfully entitled to try and uphold the legislation. Somebody voted them in. If you want to, uh, you know, stop them, as you say, abusing your tax dollars, vote them out. Yeah. You know, get behind uh, the Liberal Party of Canada in the circumstances, certainly on the legalization issue, and vote them out. Uh, that's your remedy, uh, not going to court to argue that they're abusing your tax dollars. Because, uh, you know, they, 
they might say, well, we forced them into it by challenging the laws that they passed, you know? So uh, I, 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 I don't think there's a cause of action there. Thank you. Um, John, I had another question for you about uh, one of the defense experts. This was Robert Mikos, who spoke to all of the changes that are happening in the United States. And, you know, there were so many new ones coming up. We talked a little bit about that. One of the things that he mentioned, though, was he kept trying to basically come to the conclusion that the trend in the United States is that personal cultivation is being completely removed and that everybody is moving to a commercial system because it's better for this reason and that reason and so on and so forth. Um, it seemed like to me, and, and I think that um, it was Tanya who, or uh, Tanya Grace who was going um, cross-examining him, and she, I think she was kind of trying to point out that it seems like it's actually towards legalization, which some, in some places includes the home growing. So uh, I wasn't quite sure what, why he was coming to that conclusion. Your thoughts on that whole thing? They haven't lynched me yet. Um, I think he was. Uh, I think his evidence was the trend in medical uh, situations was going away from uh, personal growing. Um, and again, we'll wait and see what Justice Phelan makes of all of it, because I think there's a number of different ways to interpret the, the evidence. Uh, certainly, as you say, uh, Tonya Grace in cross-examination, I think, brought out the trend is towards legalization. And, of course, legalization, uh, it, it was kind of ironic in a couple of cases to hear that uh, you can't grow medicinally or for medicinal purposes, but you can grow for recreational purposes. Right. So uh, it seems kind of uh, like well, you know, medicinal is included in the recreational, so it doesn't exactly. And so people were growing recreationally for medicinal. <laughs> Nobody was going to stop them. So I found that a bit odd. But I showed that conflict between those two perspectives, um, and and also there's a bit of confusion because some of them are pure CBD states, uh, and so you can't grow, they're saying you can't grow it, um, and so that, I think, clouds the statistics a little bit as well, but, you know, again, uh, Justice Phelan's going to have the job, well, first we're going to have to put something in writing to persuade him that uh, he should accept what we submitted in terms of the trend, uh, and I'm sure you can expect the government will, uh, will, will stick with uh, uh, his evidence that the trend in medical, but you know, that's not the issue here in Canada. It's not about trends. It's about are your constitution, are the constitutional rights of medically approved patients being impacted under Section 7 of the Charter? And if they are, are those limits that they've attempted to impose, are they demonstrably justifiable, reasonable limits that are prescribed by law? Demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. That's the issue in Canada. Very interesting to hear what's going on in the U.S. and a huge influence on us politically. Uh, very interesting to hear what's going on in the Netherlands and in Israel. Um, it would have been nice to hear maybe about Spain and Uruguay and uh, for Portugal, Portugal and a few yeah. others. But again, the issue isn't really about <coughs> a royal commission on what's happening throughout the world. It's about... Uh, the situation here in Canada, <laughs> right, and now, under our constitutional structure. Now, John, just just quickly, uh, you did mention earlier in our conversation about the safe injection site here and how that relates to the the Section Seven rights being violated. Will that information does that come up in this case in any way? Will you be re referencing that oh, kind of stuff? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. There are a number of uh, important Supreme Court of Canada cases that have been decided over the last few years and. PHS, Portland Hotel Society uh, versus Canada, is the supervised injection site one, and it's very important because it deals with these principles of fundamental justice and defines their ambits, as does the Bedford case, the, um, the uh, madam in Toronto, uh, the sex trade uh, worker case. That uh, decision of the Supreme Court of Canada is very important as well in dealing with these principles. And very recently, the Carter case, the uh, doctor-assisted uh, uh, dying situation. Uh, that, uh, too, dealt with these issues of life, liberty, security of the person, principles of fundamental justice. So we've got a, you know, four or five fairly recent Supreme Court of Canada cases that are going to provide guidance 
not only to us in terms of the arguments that we're making, but hopefully, well, definitely to Justice Phelan uh, as well in terms of uh, the lay of the land. And hopefully Smith uh, will be there too. Now, John, as part of the, the Section 7, really showing that the patients are being forced to choose between, you know, their health and liberty. Um, part of that is about this idea of affordability of the product itself through the LPs, um, because obviously the price of, of buying from an LP is greatly inflated compared to a price of growing it yourself. Um, and so this keeps coming up. How important is that aspect in this case, really? Like, is that a, a really key part of the Section 7 part, or is it that important? Well, I think on the evidence, it's a key part. Um, it means that, uh, you know, it, it illustrates, we say, that the government hasn't covered all people. And the obvious uh, group of people is, uh, are those who can't afford it. Uh, and the evidence, we say, supports that. I mean, there's uh, uh, an interesting thing, you know, we've got lots of uh, particularly senior citizens who have been prescribed drugs by doctors and pharmacists that uh, are unable to afford their medicine, and they apparently sit at home and don't take their medicine and end up clogging up the emergency wards. And uh, so there's a problem that exists in relation to people's uh, insurance coverage and what goes on across the country in the different provinces simply in terms of one's access to prescribed drugs. But you can't grow those prescribed drugs. You can't make those prescribed drugs. I mean, I think if you looked into some of them, aspirin, you might be able to figure it out um, because many of them come from plants and trees and things originally too. But, you know, what I'm saying, we know there's a huge uh, situation in terms of people's ability to produce cannabis for themselves in small or large amounts and uh, cheaper than it obviously is for somebody else to make it or grow it for you. And so, you know, that's the, the, the main distinction there. But ideally, hopefully the Canadian government uh, and the provinces will come up with a system in which all medically approved patients are able to access the medicine they require, whatever it might be, uh, in order to have a really, truly uh, top-notch healthcare system. And now, as part of the affordability issue here in Canada, at least historically, people have not been able to get health insurance that would cover their medicine. So, you know, marijuana wouldn't be covered like other medicines are, and so, of course, that limits access because it's very, very expensive. You know, usually you could get a health plan that would cover your expensive medication if you had some illness in Canada. But now, as part of Wilkins' testimony, he mentioned a green shield option that's been available for three months. And, I, and since then, I've had conversations um, with Matt Murnau, and he said Sun Life is now announcing that they're coming out with an insurance policy for marijuana. Does that affect this case in any way? Um, no. I mean, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, you know, this, the case is based on the facts that exist now. And uh, certainly, if the government uh, does, or if private health insurers do figure out a way to cover people, uh, that will go a long way to presumably helping the LP market um, for those who don't want to grow for themselves or go to a dispensary or compassion club. Uh, they will then be able to afford the LP prices um, if it's covered under their insurance. And so, uh, again, you know, the objective, hopefully, at the end of the day is that uh, anybody in Canada who needs medicine uh, will be able to get it. And uh, either through having bought insurance that's adequate and covers it all, or because they're wealthy enough to do so. Or because, in some cases, they're able to produce it for themselves. And, and just really quickly, um, the other thing that came up that I noted was the idea of inspections, and this keeps coming up about Health Canada inspections, you know, um, private inspections that electricians could do, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and of course, uh, Wilkins, the insurance agent, was there, and he was talking about grows that he had inspected for insurance purposes, that kind of stuff. This whole idea of inspections, how much does that play into your side of the case and maybe the, the government side? I think it's a, a very important aspect of the evidence. Um, you know, the evidence is clear that Health Canada, on its uh, uh, documentation, says you're supposed to comply with all bylaws and, and local laws. 
And uh, it goes without saying that uh, if you're legal, uh, you should try and comply with the laws, not just because you want to and you don't want to get into trouble, but again, because you don't want to cause any harm to your neighbors. These laws aren't just arbitrarily, you know, they're there for a reason. They're there to ensure that things are done reasonably and securely and that we take into account that we're a society living together. And so people need to be encouraged to do that. And so they say, well, it's gone to 38,000. How the heck can we uh, inspect all of these? It's just, you know, it's, it's huge. And they're right if they were going to do it all the time. There is stuff in the evidence about the cost of some of their uh, blitz inspections that they did. But there's also they evidence... They haven't done very many, though, or th There's certainly none. not very many, but there was also evidence of um, the cost to some local governments, which were far less. And so, and you know, we know that they've had these uh, inspection teams. Pro uh, Professor Garris talked about the inspection teams in Surrey and how successful they were, or are. Uh, we know that uh, local uh, municipalities do building inspections and fire inspections and electrical inspections and and on a regular basis. Uh, so uh, we will submit that uh, the inspection process can be worked out between all these levels of government. And I think Eric Nash's evidence today actually was quite good on the point that really, if you get the permit, you have to prove that you've complied by filing those documents with the, the regulator that approves you so that they see you've complied. And, you know, so that the incidence of inspection uh, sh should be required less if you've been able to prove that to them and thereby reduce the costs. And also try and have the local government people do it as well. I, I remember thinking to myself, gee, in this day and age, you know, I've had people come into my office with a, an iPhone and show me the inside of their super duper lab where they're hoping they'll become an LP approved by Health Canada. So I say to myself, why don't they have a video conferencing room in there, whoever the regulator may be, and you can show them the inside of your grow room that way. Um, and, and who was it? Was it, was it uh, Ramo or somebody who talked about an app uh, I think it was uh, 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 Scott Wilkin, but their app, it wasn't the app in the way we talk about it on the iPhone, it was simply an application for the insurance thing. But, uh, you know, with this app, uh, there's an app for this and an app for that. Uh, isn't there an app out there yet where you can simply uh, show the grow room and maybe take it close to the plants? And You know, because I, I think there is something like that, and uh, I'm trying to remember who it was who, who gave the evidence that you could, and I think it was Ramo, you could show right up close to the plant and ask other people, what's my problem? Yeah, that Ramo has a service They would all uh, call you and, and you'd get a whole bunch of information. Well, why can't we do that uh, yeah. nowadays with this uh, amazing technology that we have? No kidding. Where people don't have to go right to the door and look in. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of those options. Yeah, and as, as you said, I mean, a cam what you can do with a camera, I mean, you c it'd be hard to really fake a lot of that, you know? So, it'd be... It'd I mean, you could, if you had some concerns, presumably you could always follow it up. Exactly, exactly. Now, John, one thing that it has been on my mind, and I'm not sure if I'm getting this right, but it seems to be a part that's not being talked about very much in relation to, uh, you know, a lot of the focus has been on the growers losing their home grows. But it seems like as part of the MMPR, in the new, under the new system, if you're a medical marijuana patient and you get, say, caught by the police, you have to show that your pot came from one of the LPs. You have to show some sort of label or some sort of container and things like that. It's now, a, no. doesn't that actually make the pot itself, if it say the injunction fails, wouldn't the pot itself become illegal if it's not from one of those LPs? You'd have to fake it somehow or show that it did come uh, from an LP. Yeah, no, that's the, the, the new method is that it's the label on the package that demonstrates that the marijuana or the cannabis that you're in possession of is legal. It's not a, a certificate, it's not a card, it's, it's not a membership card, it's not a license with your photo on it anymore. That's the way, and so they can control uh, the illicit market. Uh, so my experience as a criminal lawyer is that we will have a run on 
uh, fraudulent labels and packaging uh, that will occur, unfortunately. But uh, that's because they've chosen that method, and that's because you will have some people who will try to break the law for a profit uh, no matter what. Yeah. So, and I think there's something similar in Washington State, which is another prevention on the exportation of uh, Canadian uh, cannabis yeah. into the U.S., because I think their system is somewhat similar in terms of proof of, of, of possession. Yeah. So, um, yeah, interesting uh, development again. Uh, uh, you know, is that what legalization will look like? A, a bottle that has a label on it, like booze or tobacco? Right. Um, well, and that's a As scary opposed prospect. to having a, a, a permit uh, to do it. Uh, one thing that I know a number of people have come up to me were fascinated about that they didn't know was that you can grow 15 kilograms of tobacco on your own property for yourself and anybody over the age of 18. <laughs> now, even the food and drug guys didn't seem to know that. <laughs> so no, I was really a bit didn't. surprised at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's that's... an exception under the Excise Act uh, on the tobacco part. Yeah, it, yeah, well, there's a lot. And, you know, it's ridiculous because you can grow any kinds of plants in your home, and tobacco is one that actually has been shown to kill you. Um, but, of course, when they compare marijuana, it's just funny that marijuana seems to be such a benign substance. It's, it's so harmless on every level that they have to go to these great extremes to find new things like the fires and other things to say that it's dangerous because the plant itself is not. That's right. I mean, uh, what can I say? Yeah, they, they really have to jump through a lot of hoops. Well, yeah. John, thank you very much for coming on today. It was a, a totally fantastic talk with you. Um, we really got into a lot of details here, so thank you so much for your hard work on everything. Thank you. I'm looking forward to having you back on again soon when things start picking up, and we'll, uh, of course, be there on April 30th at 9.30 in the morning to see how the, the rest of the fireworks go. So. You're the new media, Jeremiah. Thanks for keeping everybody informed. I'm happy to be there. It's been a pleasure for me, absolutely. Thanks, John. Awesome. John Conroy. And so I, I think uh, I see that Remo's in the house, too, and, I, and Jason Wilcox is here. So I was hoping that... Uh, and, oh, yeah, when we have John's legal team is in the house. We've got a lot of peeps in the house today. Um, it's a good show. Yeah, it's, it's already 6.36, but I think we're probably going to be going a little long today um, because I wanted to talk to these guys we won't go we won't go too too long but jason oh we can but we can all snuggle in here we we need a third mic you know what i'll just hand remo my mic when i'm uh, I'll, I'll ask a question here okay but, j man please do remo. Get, your, get, your weed. get your weed don't worry about it grab your stuff man how you feeling you were there you saw a lot of what happened the the craziness in the courtroom and uh I feel good about it, so I can only imagine how you feel about it. You know, you've been, this has been a big, huge thing in your life. You've been working hard from the beginning to get this thing going. And, you know, and now we're actually seeing the result of your hard work in a lot of ways. So how do you feel, man? What do you think about that? I say thank you to all the patients and everybody involved. And a uh, quick question to John, if he hasn't left the room. Hopefully we weren't billed for that lecture. Uh, but it was a great update. <laughs> uh, but on a more serious note, honestly, I feel extremely proud. Part of the reason I asked Ramo to come on is because he's one of those founding members that, you know, when I first went to, it must have sounded pretty crazy to say we were going to restrain the government, put them on trial, and, uh, and, and here we are just having done that, a federal injunction in place. And I'd also note that we have four federal judges uh, in relation to that injunction that have said there's no public safety. And uh, that eliminates the whole fire mold and organized crime. And I feel that they failed to, to substantiate that again from what I've seen. So I don't know how you feel about that, but uh, Raymo, what do you feel? Do, have they substantiated that? We'll get into it. Raymo as the expert, too. <laughs> no, they, I, I mean, well, I was an expert witness. I can't believe it, eh? That was, <laughs> actually, that, that was the funniest experience I've ever had in my life. I'm not going to lie to you here, Jeremiah. When I went up there for the first 20 minutes or so, I don't know if it was apparent, but I was totally shit in my pants. I was nervous as hell. I was definitely out of my comfort zone. You seem totally normal, man. You seem fine. You did a great job, seriously. All right. Well, later on when I got more medi uh, less medicated, I should say, I, I think I woke up and uh, I think I embarrassed her. Uh, she, she turned beet red like at least a half dozen times that I've seen. 
Yeah, I was surprised, Remo. She seemed to be really thinking, because you, you kept talking about the fact that you're an entertainer. You were an expert witness to talk yeah. about growing, and you are an expert, but you're also an entertainer. You have your shows. that you, uh, You're you an educator as well. Yeah, so I try to do a little bit of everything. Yeah, she wanted to play your video as a way of showing what how you consume your medicine is the way she described it. Oh, that was uh, hilarious. Well, yeah, <laughs> and so, and, but afterwards, she really did seem embarrassed. Like she She's like, so you're saying you weren't smoking in that video? <laughs> well, if, if she would have just read the comments and watched the video, like it's very apparent that we're smoking a very small joint beside it. I don't know if you guys have seen this. A few people fell for it. They thought we we're actually smoking that newspaper and tape, but come on, there's no way. No. I thought it was funnier than hell. <laughs> Full of seeds and stuff, right? Like it was a big giant male plant. Or, there oh, was sorry. no seeds. It was no, just no, male. Sorry, just yeah. male plant. But it was like massive and scraggly looking and totally ugly. And oh yeah. You guys just wrapped it in newspaper with a piece of tape around. Oh, with stalks and all. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, if yeah, that yeah. was a real joint, wouldn't we take the stalk out? Yeah. I don't know. I think most owners would. I'm not that desperate to get high. <laughs> newspaper. I mean, who smokes? You can't smoke. The Vancouver anymore. Sun. Even the government lawyers should know that much. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. No, that was pure comedy. It seemed like to me that they a lot of the stuff that they were bringing up in, on your side of things, and a lot of stuff in general, that they just weren't prepared for this. I mean, it just seems crazy to me like that you would go in with so little actual real statistical information, and the witnesses that they called to sort of back themselves up, they see all of them seemed to fall apart on the stand when it really came to their evidence. So, I mean, Jason, you were saying that you don't think they proved the case. I don't think they proved it at all. And I don't think they had anything. Was there any tidbits from them that you actually thought they had something on? I, I would say no. I would say that, w in my own opinion, we proved that through Officer Holquest that uh, there's no such thing as organized crime. No medical patient has ever been charged um, and convicted of an offense. No fires have been started, as we learned from Langaris. In fact, Langaris testified that of the 400 patients he chose to investigate and give a red ticket to have them investigated, that all 400 came into compliance. That was quite a statement that he kind of made coming because that kind of says, hey, medical patients will come into compliance if you allow us to sort of inspect them like we're militant. Um, you know, once again, constitutionally. Um, and quite, really there quite, were only a few that didn't already have inspections. It was like a very small number that they had to get up to speed or whatever, right? Exactly. And at the end of the day, Langaris showed that there was absolutely zero fires caused by medical marijuana gardens, and there's 16,000 in British Columbia. And he, this is what was sold to Joe Public. So, you know, we're looking forward at CannabisInCanada.ca to actually bringing forward what this costs. What did this cost to fight us? Because we know what it's, no co kidding. it's costed us a quarter million dollars. And God knows Mr. Conroy, he has three over, th over 3,000 in, in unbilled hours. So just do the math at, yeah. at, at, at his billing rate. Well, and to bring all those government witnesses here, to have them stay, and just all of the costs associated on their side, man. Oh, the lawyer, that's, the that's lawyers that are in the house tonight, those that. those that don't know, the lawyers that are sitting over to the right or left hand side, Tanya Grace and uh, Matthew, you know, these are the people. If it wasn't for Tanya Grace's amazing performance, we would never have got the injunction. She was just on fire, and she just nailed the, the whole ethical issue around patients. If you just take your gardens away, uh, based on this premise of fire, mold, and organized crime, public safety. That that's, that's wrong without having any statistical data to back it up. And once again, four federal judges have already said there's simply no statistical data to support their case. And, and I was happy to see that. When I seen Vaz cut up whole quest, oh, dude, when I seen that, that, that was, that was the every, everybody that I know that signs these checks who are in this room from Mr. Paul Hunt to Sandra, people that sign these, these checks, you know, um, they understand now where the quarter million dollars has went to. Yeah, well spent. Yes, well, well and, spent. And I mean, the, the job that he did in absolutely turning the guy on his head was just fantastic. You know, it was almost painful to watch because, you know, Garris got it too. And really, he was, uh, the Globe and Mail published an article about how ridiculous Garris looked because he couldn't back up any of the information in his own affidavit. And, you know, and Garris has been widely quoted as saying, a grow up, a home, a, a, even a medical marijuana one, all any grow up, is 24 times more likely to have a fire in it. That's this number that Garris keeps his pushing around everywhere. His, his yeah. math was totally wrong he on that. He didn't have any, any evidence at all to support it. And the only time they ever have any evidence of grow fires is illegal ones, first of all. And then they lump it in with meth labs. Now, here's a question for you. Now, now I had a chance to interview in studio Mr. Tim Moen. 
And uh, now I, what I liked is that he got up there, challenged the fire chief. He has that, uh, that analysis um, background that you need to, to properly come to certain conclusions. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, the only way that they could attack him was the fact that he was the leader of the Libertarian Party at the same time. That seemed to be like something they felt they needed to bring up twice. Well, it was like the way they were trying to attack Remo. It was that <coughs> they use ad hominem attacks, attacking someone's character instead of the actual arguments they're trying to make. It's not even logical. <coughs> it's, it's a logical fallacy. It, it, it totally isn't logical. Well, so, the, the, this is where, again, back in 2012, those that remember, I said, we're silent now, but you'll hear us later. You know, here we are now nationally unified and, and ready to continue funding this case. They can continue to appeal. We'll continue to fund. We'll continue to fight. And that's all that matters. Our lawyers are here to say they're going to keep fighting. Again, and Mr. Conroy has 3,000 unbilled hours. That yeah. tells you that this man's not just in this for the money. You know, for those out there that feel that, uh, I feel unfortunate that you've never had a chance to get to know the man that's actually fighting for us because he truly is an ethical and honorable man. Yeah. Oh, they've done such an amazing job. Seriously, they do deserve a round of applause. Give these guys a round of applause. They, it's been one of the most exciting... It is the most exciting case that I've ever sat through. Like, there's been some exciting ones in the past, but this one is above and beyond because it's really been fun to see. It's been satisfying in a way that, for one thing... Health Canada had, um, I can't, I'm forgetting her name now, um, she was, the, uh, the Health Canada, oh, Janine Rashot. Janine Rashot oh, was the on health the set. The Health Canada one, she yeah. She actually basically designed the new MMPR program, like she was, that was her thing. And she was the one consulting with the public to come up with the ideas and that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, uh, for her, when she was under cross-examination, she didn't really have a good a good reason to do a lot of the things that she, you know, the reasons that she designed her things. She had no answers for that. So I was satisfied in a way inside to see her getting grilled so hard about this shit-ass program that she designed. You know, like, and it, she was, she's kind of personally responsible, and with her other cronies. But what she said was that it's not really up to her, that Stephen Harper's kind of telling her what to do. So, you know, it, I kind well, of that, feel did, sad. That's where it comes down to. We see the monopoly that the MMPR is very much, and I can say this now that I'm not being called up on the stand. They decided not to cross-examine me, so I can say what I want now. Um, I, I say that there's a monopoly and that the federal government was in, involved with this monopoly, and that's the MMPR, and that's why there's... Uh, even now, the, the, we just ran a show on Brian Reiser over in Squamish on CannabisInCanada.ca. Uh, once again, we, we, we ran a story on this gentleman. We had Don from Weeds in there, Don Breer. Uh, we had Paul Hunt in there and uh, Rohan to talk about just what's going on with the clubs. You know, the RCMP, not only did they say shut your club down, which is fine, you know, they're following the law. Yeah, but what, why, why are they saying, oh, and also tell your members to go here and they give a list, Appendix A, which is a list of all the LPs, their phone numbers, their websites, which is basically solicitation. And I don't have a copy of those letters I didn't with me. see that me. part of the whole thing. Yeah, wow. it's, in the, it's in the video, and that's what got Dawn and, and the rest of us really going, and we're waiting to see. It's, it's really the, the move right now is on the RCMP, but I don't believe that uh, Brian is going to change his stance. I believe he's going to hold it down. I've spoken to Dana. I've updated Dana. I've updated others, you know, club owners, uh, you know, to rally behind this. And K Mr. Kurt Tussaw is on the case. Yeah, well, good, because, I mean, the whole dispensary issue, I think, is getting, though it's getting better in some ways because there's more of them, the hype around them and the, the whole idea that they're dangerous and the media coverage around them has definitely been increased in the past few months, you know? It's really kind of picking up a lot. And I keep seeing these articles in the Vancouver press that say, oh, there's so many of these dispensaries now, there's 60 of them, they're horrible, there's so many of them. And really, the problem they never get to. They never show you in the newspaper articles what's the actual problem with the dispensary. You know, they, they say, oh, well, there's 60 of them, so that's a big deal. Well, there's 60 coffee shops. There's 60 7-Elevens and convenience stores. There's, there's 60 liquor stores. There's 60 bars. There's 60 drug stores, pharmacies themselves. So why shouldn't there be 60 dispensaries? Like, wh where's the actual problem the newspapers never tell you? So... 
but there's a lot of hype around them, and that's scary because once those newspapers create that echo chamber of stigmatizing the dispensaries themselves, then the politicians feel like they're more powerful to do something about it. Well, the newspapers are talking about it all the time, so we got to do something about it. On, on the note of the newspapers, I would I, I would ask anybody in this room to call your media contacts because we have to ask ourselves. With all that media hype that Mark and myself and others, we sat down, we organized, we, we, uh, and yourself and, and various others, to pull the triggers to get all these activists out there on that, on that opening day, all that media coverage, and only one channel actually aired us. Yeah. So who's blacking this out? Who don't want us talking? Yeah. No, it's true. There's, There's a microphone right there. Off air. Or do you want to share it on air? Oh, off air, okay. Yeah, now it's true. I think the media, it's, it's a strange thing because the media does pay a lot of attention to the marijuana issue, but it's still, and they're actually, they pay attention to it in a more positive light than they did it in the past, but there's still this superficial edge to it where they rarely get into the actual details of things. It's always these surface issues, and they kind of like, they show, they're like, oh, it's a supportive kind of tone, but they really, in the end, kind of undercut you because they're not giving the proper details of the thing. And as, as you remember, when I got raided and the cops cut my plants down, and I, Mr. Condor and I, we sued them for 8,000, I can talk about it because there's no gag order, we refused it, but we sued them for 8,000 plus for damages and it settled out of court. But um, the point is, is that was another media blackout. I'm used to this because these high profile cases, we get blacked out. Joe Average does not know the medical patients of Canada just kicked the federal government's ass in court. It costed us over a quarter million dollars to do it. And at the same time, if they knew how much the government has paid to fight us with some of this international law and other bullshit, I believe they would be very upset. And I think that's what we need to do is find a way to convey that message to Joe Average. And I'm not sure how to do that, but I think we need to. Yeah, well, I think we're having an effect. But, you know, I, I think part of it, I've seen in the past that part of it is making it easy for the media. So the more we do to actually, you know, give them press releases, give them all the information where they don't have to think about it, the more likely they are to use it. Because a lot of times, I, I do believe that they are trying to ba basically screw us in a lot of ways. But I think sometimes they just don't have the resources to put on it. So they'll do things like, you know, instead of covering us at 420 or Cannabis Day or whatever it is, they'll cover the sun run because there's way, you know, that's there. This Vancouver Sun is sponsoring it and everything else. And they only have so many reporters to put on these things, so they just put them all onto this one. So, you know, and I've talked to the editors of a couple of these things, and they say, well, just give us the information, give us pictures and stuff, and we'll just publish your stuff, and then they don't have to pay somebody to be down there all day. Well, I just, I wonder why that day, with all that coverage, other than the noon hour doing live, all that coverage, that it, when it got to the editor, they just muzzled it. They said, no, we're done. We're not gonna, we're not gonna air this, and that's what happens. And they do it, they do it a lot. Oh, yeah, and they I, do. And I'm just wondering, Oh, sure. Exactly. Well, there, there is corporate the interest. There's a monopoly. And they have, uh, they have a benefit in keeping the marijuana industry down because... That's why we have our own press, though, right? That's why we do our own press, make our own videos. We spread the word on our own, right? Yes. Uh, you're a big part of that. Same with Jason, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely, man. Make your own media. That's the way of the future. And when you have something to say, don't be afraid to say it. Get out there and do it. Uh, Remo, that's something that was really funny in this case. Is that uh, you know they they played one of your videos and they were they were bringing you up a lot, talked about your website and everything that you're working on. Yeah. Um, so you know, part of it was that when they bring up stuff about you in the future, they can't necessarily use that against you. And we had a conversation about that. So you yeah. were kind of happy to get some of that information into the court. Well, I've got 14 clean cups now. That's kind of cool. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they, they brought up your cannabis cup wins and all of that as well. Yeah, apparently once it's uh, been entered into the Kev Canada Evidence Act, they can't use it against you. So, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> and I make shatter too. So, <laughs> I got that out there too, right? I, I do. I do think that. I think that uh, what we'll see in April in closing arguments is they'll try to bring up and try to discredit Ramo and say he shared his medication. He breached the federal MMAR. And Mr. Conroy will get up and likely say something along the lines that it has nothing to do with why Mr. Colasanti was on the stand. He's up there because he's an expert in growing and what he does with that medication or in his personal life has nothing to do with why he was tendered an expert in this hearing. That's just my opinion as an outsider. Yeah, I'm just uh, making sure that we're still, we had like a little disconnection here for a second it looked like. I just want to make sure that the 
chatters and people at home are still watching us out here. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, this has been really exciting for me to be part of this whole thing and to see it all go down. Um, I think, really, it's just a matter of crossing our fingers for the next month or two um, until April, the end of April. And uh, I, I don't know, how do you, is there an anticipation? Are you feeling like a stress from this at all? Or how, how's your Absolutely psyche? Absolutely not. Like, Actually, no? you know, I, I would say to people now, go plant your gardens. If you had any questions, go plant them. Uh, Mr. Conroy's been on my show. Check it out at cannabisincanada.ca. Um, he was here tonight. He explained in detail. You got to ask yourself, would a Queen's Council attorney be out talking to the social media after a trial that just before going into, you know, trial, again, the final, uh, final hearings? Um, this is something I believe that we're very confident. And from my own talks with Mr. Conroy, uh, we simply don't feel that the, they've substantiated that. But there is... Just to be fair, there is that economic twist that they're throwing in there, and it's always been there. I mean, the government's always made this little, well, patients can afford it, so that we, they, it should just be on them because this is a controlled drug. And I keep saying there's no toxicity, there's no addiction, there's no death. But, and Mr. Conroy also keeps, re, you know, again, um, alluring to the fact that there's no deaths re attributed to cannabis and therefore should not be uh, governed like a gun, something I've often said since 2012. Most important, they did not substantiate fire, mold, and organized crime. They didn't substantiate a single medical patient to a crime, nor a medical patient to a fire. And that's a shame on the government for trying to do that. And their mold experts, well, we'll leave that up to the courts to, uh, to determine. Yeah, yeah, well, uh-oh, I think we're getting a little heat on the mics there. I think we're okay. Um, you know, one thing that, um, this whole idea, I mean, a lot of this, the focus has been on growers. And even you and I, last week on the show, we were talking about, um, you know, the, the growers are really at the heart of this case in a lot of ways. But when I was thinking about it over time, I was thinking that, you know, a, a medical patient who's not a grower right now, you know, under the injunction and under the old MMAR, if a medical patient was caught with a bag of weed on them, you know, it, they didn't necessarily have to prove where that weed came from. You know, you could get weed from your friend, you could get it from anywhere, and as long as you had a card, you know, you didn't have to show a record of where that came from. So you were kind of protected in a way. Well, now in the future, this new MMPR states that you have to show that that pot came from one of these LPs, and it has to be within a 30-day time period. They actually have a sticker on there that expires in 30 days. So when a med patient gets busted with a bag of weed that doesn't have, that's not from the last 30 days and doesn't have an LP sticker on it, they're fucked. They, they, they are... But yeah. there, there, is yeah. a, there is a bit of a loophole because what they've left open and a, a weak loophole that they've left open is that um, they haven't addressed the, the source of that, of that. Like they said, the medical weed that you cannot have um, in your possession if it expires. Sorry, there was a point I was going to lure to there. But uh, the, uh, the patients that order that, again, it expires after 30 days. And that's where they kind of get them in the sense of uh, not being allowed. What else, sorry, what I was going to go to was the prescription itself. I tell any patient, if you get a prescription from a doctor or a letter from a doctor with their seal on it and their stamp, whatever, um, you get that from a doctor, keep that because that is what you need right now constitutionally until Allard is decided. Because right now we're back to Parker. You have to choose between your life, you know, your liberty, or, well, basically your liberty and your medicine and your health, which, which is something that flies in opposition to the Constitution. I say go ahead and plant. For people outside the injunction, no, Mr. Conroy, well, got my affidavit back in, got in all 170 statements of the patients that were saying, we fall outside this injunction, we need help. And uh, Justice Phelan has that information. It's went unattested by the Crown. So uh, let's just see what happens when he renders his decision. And... Uh, hopefully extends that injunction to, uh, to allow people to change their address and uh, as well as potentially allow new people. Uh, we don't know what can happen. I'm not going to try and speculate on what the judge is going to do. Well, it's really just a big, huge question mark at this point because as of April 30th, well, then it's going to take more time for the judge to actually come back with a decision. But even if, it, you know, even if the judge finds for us completely, there still will be an appeal. And then there's, you know, there's all, it, it, this is going to go on for a long time. And it well, could change back and forth a bit before the end of it. If it all goes our way, which we believe it will, just based on what the government's provided, there's already four judges. So we believe that Mr. Conroy is on my show saying it could go four to five years. If they appeal us, 
uh, to the federal appeals bench and then appeal us once again to the SCC. And not only is that going to cost probably a million dollars, um, they'll, they'll try to bleed us out um, rather than allow the facts to just get out to Joe Average. And I hope that we can continue to somehow source the media to catch the ethical side of this story that 36,000 or 40,000 patients tried to get thrown under the bus by the federal government of Canada in favor of a monopoly called the MMPR. Yeah. And it really is a monopoly. It's handing all of our, <coughs> basically the entire medical program, <coughs> over to just a few corporations. <coughs> and really, these guys have to have a lot of money in order to get involved. It's not like just average Joe can, like, you know, sign up. You have to have security. You have to have all this cash invested. And, uh, you know, I think somebody, somebody was asking a question whether or not the LPs will be pissed if... Uh, you know, if they this is some. I know I got to speak to this now. Since 2012, I've told people, even on private listservs, those of us that are on there know this. I said there'd only be 51 permits. That's what they got. They projected in the RIAS report. That's the backgrounder for Health Canada's MMPR. That's what they projected for physical years one and two. Then people got pissed, so they changed the language to if you meet compliance. Now, what these people that are applying to BLPs are realizing is the government keeps changing the definition of compliance. And what happens then is we got people that are, the government goes and writes in a new thing, and then they get a message in the mail and says, no, now if you're within 500 yards of, of a house, you can't, you, you're not in compliance, and people are getting shut down. I would argue now that as ULPs get cut down, there's 1,200 of you, 400 of you are at level five, as you fail and as you get cut down, contact the Coalition Against Repeal, or sorry, the Cannabis Rights Coalition. Uh, contact us, get in touch with people, and, uh, and certainly know that there's a way that we can fight back. You guys have a lot more money than us medical patients did, and I believe that there's, an un there's not a free and fair market in Canada, and it's something we need to address. I'm not sure at what level or in which way, whether that's legal or political, but it's gonna take money and it's gonna take a collective push. And I believe once you 1,200 realize there's only going to be about 10 years that get a license, maybe you'll all wake up. Right. And, and actually, the funny thing is, I think that if they allowed just, you know, if they designed the MMPR to allow for the home grows, it probably wouldn't have really been that bad of a system in a way. It would have been at least, you know, you, you have some expectation that's going to always go on when it comes to the growers, the LPs themselves. But if people could still grow at home and still do everything they could under the MMAR, then having those LPs there on the side wouldn't really hurt very much. And in fact, it might be a benefit to certain people who can't grow it themselves, <laughs> grandmas or whoever who aren't comfortable with going down to the uh, local dispensary. Uh, actually, I, m I mentioned that in court. It's kind of stupid that they don't allow MMAR patients currently that are licensed to buy from uh, an LP because there is crop failure. Sometimes you want to try a new strain out, you know, etc. right? Sometimes a strain doesn't work for you, so you can purchase something, maybe something that works, right? Thank God for dispensaries because that's, you know, they're really there to catch your fall just in case something like that happens, right? And I think that's another thing too is, uh, you know, the coalition was grassroots and Mr. Conroy and I talked about that in our interview. Um, and, and talked about, you know, he, he was impressed with, with how this was done because there is a true national collective. And those medical patients who've been part of this, that's who I really lo like to thank. That's who really deserve a, a round of applause. Some of them have fought, uh, they're in wheelchairs just using their fingers. Some of them are partially mobile. But they fought with their tooth and nails and, and their supporters to get us to where we are. And uh, that and the support of our legal team, I think, uh, in conjunction um, with, uh, with, of course, a really good case, we, we have now made history. And I think that plants in this country, because of Allard, will be legal for everybody, no matter who, what country, or what politician or political party legalizes. Man, well, I, I hope that's absolutely true, and I'm feeling really good about the way things are going. You know, I wasn't sure going in because the, the few cases that I've been to have ended kind of not really good for us, you know? Like, uh, there, there's been, I was at the Malmo case, his last one. I was at the, the Bennett case as well. And both of those, the judges, though the, uh, in the Malmo case, the judge was very uh, friendly and stuff. In the end, he kind of like gave, gave David four months in jail and gave him a, you know, it was just a slap on the wrist, but he, had to do what he had to do. Um, in the Bennett case, the judge was t completely kooky and gave the most brutal, bad ruling. Um, and so I had seen 
what I thought were two really well-argued cases, and the judges basically didn't go along with any, even though they had sort of responded in a way that seemed positive, when it came to the end of it, they totally, you know, turned over and did what the government wanted them to do, basically. Um, so I was a little discouraged by those. In this case, I'm feeling like Phelan is on, you know, on board with certain aspects of our side. He's totally on our side. Yeah, he seems to... I felt he was totally on our side. That's the feeling I got when I was on the stand. And I don't know if you know that's the feeling you got by watching, but um, look, he, he stood up for me a few times, and he he cut you know uh, the prosecutor's questions off and said, "No, you can't ask that." And you know, what's his personal business got to do with this, right? That was awesome. I would also note that okay, this is important for people who paid attention to the case that Mr. Conroy applied for an adjournment until after the SEC hearing. Now the, we got to look at this. This, uh, this particular judge asked that this be extended till April so he could then absorb this. I think that is also um, to potentially allow for, uh, um, again, the proceedings to start at that point. Mr. Conroy, I believe, said September, did he say? He doesn't think it will end? Oh, yeah. Well, I think it, yeah, it could go on for a while. Um, but it, as far as uh, the pleadings, uh, the, the final arguments, the um, right. closing arguments will be uh, potentially up till September. Yeah, it, I, and at one point I thought somebody mentioned December, but that seems like insanity. But um, well, I remember September yeah, because September. it's my, my, my birthday's in September, so right. that's why I was thinking, damn, that would be a good birthday present. Because once again, once that victory's in, then we go to appeals, and most importantly is that we can address the injunction, like Mr. Conroy said. And the evidence has been across the judge's desk. The judge has read it, understands that there's patients suffering that are that are falling into that area of irreparable harm. We want on the, the I mean, people think this is about their gardens. It's not. It's about your reasonable access to your medicine and whether it's being infringed on by the federal government with their monopoly that they tried to put in place. That's why I'm glad that we came along. We formed a grassroots movement. A bunch of different groups united. And uh, we've grown to be a very strong medical army and, uh, and, and raising a, a fundraising mechanism that's not only for medical, it's for anything that has, stands for liberty or constitutional rights in this country when it has to do with cannabis, our medicine, our plant. And we're going to continue to defend that from now on and, and, and as this war needs to continue until there is a, a reasonable, free and fair market in Canada. Hell yeah, man, definitely. And hopefully, you know, you know one of the things that worries me a little bit is that if this, if we fail, in this case, uh, the government wins on their side and we have to stick through with this really bad MPR system, when legalization finally does come in, John mentioned this, they might stick with that model or stick with a model like this where you have to show your LP weed or, you know, whatever, and, you know, you no know growing at home, only getting it from these major suppliers, that kind of stuff. That would be really tragic if legalization looked like that shit. Well, as, as, you, as you know, though, I've been on your show for two years ranting and raving and sometimes acting like a lunatic and you know i'm so glad that i don't have to be like that anymore no. trying to get people to understand that this case and r versus smith will determine any legalization platform proposed by the federal government of canada because they all answer to the constitution of canada and any decision that's decided under it therefore if alert if we're allowed to grow and when they legalize it'll be a matter of what's reasonable number of plants for adults to grow that are consenting adults. It's like 7.07 right now. Um, I, I wanted to... That's late. Yeah, exactly. If anybody has to plug their meters. I wanted to get to some of Freddie... I was going to play one of Freddie's videos. Yeah, that, we, need, we, need like a, we need like a dab break, so play, 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 play Freddie's video so we can do a dab. Yeah, well... Uh, do we got Freddie, any questions I, I from your audience? Freddie. Well, that's the other thing is we could, we should probably ask if anybody has any questions before we get on to talking about what the. Hey, other everybody, you got questions? Anybody out here have a question for Remo or Jason? Is there anybody who wants to ask these fine gentlemen a question at all? Oh, we have we have a question. Just wondering when I can get my next dab, Remo. I'm waiting for a dab. How much longer? Just wondering. Oh, you could do a dab right away, Bob. No, go ahead. You have to borrow a torch. You ran out of gas. I'm sorry. Seven ten. Oh, we got one right here. Okay, hold on. Oh, I got to do a dab. dab. John's Pardon got me. a dab lined up. Hash okay, Master there Johnny. You go. Here, we'll get the other cam here. What is the airspeed velocity of an Albanian squirrel? Does anybody know? Ah. Does anybody know? Is that a trick question? What? 
I've just been confused. Yeah, I thought it was a squirrel. Does anybody really... Why don't we watch Monty Python's Holy Grail again? Was it a squirrel or a swallow? Maybe it was a swell. They're just British. That's just the British I thought accent. it was a flying squirrel. Yeah. So, yeah, of course, there's been a lot of activists who have been outside of the courtroom, not just fun on the inside of the courtroom. One of those is Mr. Neil Magnuson, been holding it down out there. Yeah. Neil. And so, Neil, Indeed. why don't you uh, tell us about, yeah, how things were going out there. You guys were uh, making a, handing out flyers, making a general fuss, even at one point disrupting the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, apparently Steve Jensen, you could hear him uh, up in the courtroom from down below. We, we did make a big fuss and a big spectacle down there. I thought we did a real good job of, of affecting the, uh, the court of public opinion. We had hand, handouts that we gave people that explained that, uh, you know, there was this court case going on and Stephen Harper wants to be the only drug dealer that sells cannabis in Canada. And uh, that uh, they're trying to stop people from growing cannabis that have had the right to do that for 13 years and that uh, this is a medicinal plant that for thousands of years has been helping, you know, through hundreds of cultures, so many people, uh, and the safety and efficacy is well established, and that it's been demonized and that we've been lied to about cannabis for decades here, and uh, how they can get involved is to call their MP uh, or, or get a hold of the coalition, and we put the website on there for them to donate to and get, get information. So we had an amazing response. Um, so much support from the public. Uh, of, the, of the nearly 5,000 handouts that we gave out, there was less than a dozen that hit the ground. And I've been in many campaigns where we've handed out handouts in the past, and that's an unheard of stat. There's always like at least one in 20 that, that people are discarding as they're walking away. And in this case, less than a dozen out of almost 5,000. Uh, these uh, handouts were pu put together by UCAN, a new forming group of activists to try to unite the activist community, United Cannabis Activist Network. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that uh, outside the court, we found that the public is very much in favor of uh, Canadians that are sick, having the ability to grow for themselves what seems to be a very safe and effective medicine for them. And it's really an outrageous infringement on our rights in a free country that we, we can't do that. If, if you can be trusted in your house to cook food on a stove with fire, then you certainly can be trusted in your home to water plants in a room with some lights. So there, there's no justification that, that, that anybody outside the courtroom ever came up with for for cannabis being prohibited to be grown by those people that have a right to do so and are supported by their doctor. Um, the public is on our side here for sure. Uh, that they're wasting tax dollars to pursue this in the face of so much public support for our side, in my opinion, is a criminal waste of public funds. I know that John said it's arguable whether they have the right because we voted them in somehow and they're, they're the government. But arguable is the key word in there for me. I think it's arguable that this is a criminal misuse of public funds in what they're trying to do here. They should be sending people starter kits for growing your own cannabis at home if, if this medicine really does offset harmful pharmaceuticals and is safer and, and more effective. So. I was, I was just going to note that uh, it, those that remember in February of 2013, before we had any plaintiffs, we were still collecting victim impact statements, 3,000 in total. We actually ordered a letter be written, or I ordered a letter be written to Health Canada. Mr. Conroy warned him that he was going to seek an injunction and that he was going to put them on trial if they proceed with what they were planning on doing. Uh, based on the premise of fire, mold, and organized crime. And that is exactly what we pursued. That's the angle when I went to Mr. Conroy was this, because that comes down to that right to liberty. If you don't pose a danger to yourself, you can put it, what you feel is going to medically help you uh, into your body. And that is an international right to autonomy. And I believe that that is also a right to liberty. And that's where they're infringing on the reasonable access which Parker was granted. Their government's not saying you can't have your medicine. They're just saying you got to buy it from us. And we've yeah. said that ain't going to happen. Like in layman's terms, at the end of the day, that's what we've said. But the reasonable access, section one, is definitely be in our gardens. In this case, it's, it's the route that we get our cannabis, of which of 40,000 patients, 36,000 chose to grow. 
and this is why this case matters because it's constitutionally going to decide um, whether gardens are going to be permitted in the country of Canada. If they're permitted for one, they'll be permitted for all. I just suggest everybody read section 15 of the charter and forward think a little bit. Well, that's exactly right, Jason. And, and, I, and I'm from the layman's point of view. I'm not a lawyer and I don't have that kind of expertise. And I, I know that John was saying that these things have to fit within the framework of what they're trying to do in a courtroom. And they've got to understand, you know, get the judge to, to, to agree that these things are violated, blah, blah, blah. For me and for other laymen, it's, it's simple. It's, it's a basic human right to be able to have access to the plants in nature. And especially if you're a sick person, I mean, who gets to tell a sick person that's suffering, that's in pain, that they can't try to use some plant that has been known to help people, that they can't use that plant? I mean, it's really basic and simple to me. I don't know why a judge has to mull this around. I don't know why we need three weeks of testimony about all these different things about this and that and this and that. There's no bodies. There's no hospital wards full of people that have been harmed by cannabis going on here. There's no justification for all these tax dollars to be wasted in the pursuit of whether or not you can be an amateur horticulturalist safely in your home or not. That kind of money, this type of tax dollars, should be devoted to where people are being harmed in our society, where there are some bodies or some, some litany of, of harms that have happened. I find this whole thing outrageous. That, that we're needing all of this to just figure out that there's a plant that has been helping people for thousands of years. There's all these people that have been proven through the courts that it's helping them. Let's help them grow it. Let's not tell them that they have to buy it off of Stephen Harper. I don't want Stephen Harper to be the only pot salesman in Canada because his weed sucks and he doesn't give a shit about me. Yeah. Man. Thank you all for helping out, by the way. Once again, thanks, I'd everybody who came out. Thanks for everybody who supported from home. Thanks to everybody who cares about this and is paying attention. Thanks to everybody for all that they're going to do in the future in calling their MP and standing out and getting together and organizing for all of us. So thanks a lot to everybody, and that's all i got to say. Yeah, no, that's definitely important to, uh, you can't understate uh, Neil's presence in front of the courtroom and, uh, and uh, providing lunches today. And, uh, he went out and got Subway for everybody, um, you know, and was, was able to do that. And uh, indeed, it, it is about the right to liberty. And again, any politician, I really don't care about politics because I've always looked to law, which is why I'm glad we got someone like Mr. Conroy uh, at lead on this, because law will determine the outcome of whether we can have plants in this country. The courts will determine whether we have plants in this country, not a politician. So the longer we look to politics, wrong direction, look to the courts. Because this medical case will set a precedent, then the legalization platforms, you decide who you want to vote for, but sure as hell not Harper. That's the only thing I can say. Awesome, man. Excellent. Well, you guys have done, both of you, amazing work, and thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, I'm going to, I see that Freddie's actually here. Yeah, we're, we got a major party going on in the crowd here. Let's show that again here. And there, there's, Freddie himself is here. Now, I want to, I want to bring Freddie up here, actually. Um, yeah. Freddie, yeah, yeah, come on Freddy, up here. You should come up here, brother. Yeah. yeah. There you go, you're live, Freddie Pritchard. How you doing, Freddie? Good, good, good. Good, good to see you here, man. You've yeah, been really peace. also hey, working TV. very hard outside the courtroom with yeah. your video camera, and you've been uploading videos every single day. Um, yeah. Some amazing stuff. I've been playing them on my show and sharing them. Uh, good work, man. Thanks, thanks a lot man. for all your hard work. Yeah, thanks. And uh, why, why, Freddie, are you down there every single day? Why is this so important to you? Well, um, I had a little uh, 13 years ago in Windsor, Ontario, uh, when people started getting a Section 56, uh, they were given the Section 56 and nowhere for anybody to get their cannabis. So it was like, wow. So we started a little club there, the Windsor Compassion Club of Windsor, and uh, we were selling for, we were selling cannabis for five dollars a gram. Uh, but we had the benefit of being able to grow it. Uh, but we we went through a bus. But um, seeing firsthand family members. Um, seeing firsthand somebody 
whose husband has to put a doobie into their trembling lips because they can't even roll their own joints. And then those trembles go away and a smile comes on a face. I guess maybe if you see it firsthand, face to face, um, and, it, and it directly affects your family like cancer does across this country um, uh, and many other illnesses, it, it hits your head in the heart, you know, and it hits you in the soul. And there's an interest and a common interest there for me uh, to fight this. And I don't have a garden and I don't have a license. And this Be, is, um, this is uh, where, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say this is where I would point to R versus Smith and how it relates to, to uh, Section 1. Uh, because section sec, or section seven and section one, because like Mr. Conroy said once again, R versus Smith is a Supreme Court of Canada test case. It's the first ever medical case to go up there, so it's really going to test those limits. Because right now, the MMPR can't save a child. A medical dispensary can. They can run out and save that baby. They can stop seizures. You know, they can help adults who suffer from MS. You know, prevent seizures. But the federal government of Canada's MMPR scheme cannot allow that due to the, uh, once again, failed and flawed laws and policies of the MMPR and the CDSA. I was just going to say, I, I hope that this really does change things, and I, I'm feeling good about where the direction that this case is going and f the way Phelan's looking. Um, I just can't see him, this judge, turning around and screwing all of the pot growers and all the medical marijuana patients. No, I just don't, I don't know, he's got a better vibe than that. So at the very least, I think he's going to throw, you know, throw us a bone, even if he can't go all the way for whatever reason. Um, he's going to be considerate, I think, at least. He's been considerate so far. So hopefully that trend continues. Freddie, I want, I'm going to wrap this up because yeah, I'm going to play yeah, no, one you guys of your videos here. Way long, man. Should, I, should I play your video? I wanted to play number 14 from yesterday. That's play the whatever one. you want. Okay. Uh, there are all my videos are there for everybody to share. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. We did it for the marijuana community, yeah. man. Right on, man. And I Thanks for the support. Fuck. Yeah. I definitely want to give a shout out to that Woo. activist group, to Freddie, awesome. and, and as well as... Here, definitely give that shout out to, uh, to uh, Freddie and, and uh, Neil for their, again, their, their fabulous work in, in standing out there, putting the signs up every day and informing the public of what's going on in that courtroom. Uh, we may have failed to pack the courtroom, but we at least managed to put on the show and now it's just a matter of allowing the courtroom theatrics to finish the experts to go and uh well the experts are done now so it's the court the courtroom theatrics are the closing arguments and uh i believe that history will, will uh will be announced we all came together on this one. yeah i think so it's really been it's cool to see the community come together in so many different ways yeah good work guys bam absolutely yeah, and thanks to you guys, huge time. And everybody that showed up here tonight, thanks to all the partiers out here. I love you guys. Thanks yeah. Mark and Jody. Thank, thank you to Mark and Jody Emery for providing the snacks and the food and the yeah. facility here tonight for the coalition. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, and uh, yeah, we're going to keep you guys updated on everything that's happening. You know, you can follow all of the news on this stuff at CannabisCulture.com, CannabisInCanada.ca, YouTube.com slash Freddie Pritchard. Freddie Pritchard. The, yeah, the Weed King. <clears throat> that's right. So, constant media sources updating for all y'all out there on the... Booyah! Love you guys out there. Uh, and thanks to Johnny B for the hash, for the hash... And he's been, he's, Johnny B's been doing awesome tweets with me. He's really been helping me a lot and doing amazing no, stuff. So. We, also have to mention, we also have to mention the fact that the Beard Brothers are here in the house, always laying it down. So once again, thank you to the Beard Brothers. And uh, of course, Ramos in the house. So I know you already mentioned that. So uh, a lot of love because, I, you know, again, that goes back to the history of the coalition, the foundation of what, what got us here and uh, the ongoing collective effort that every time we do an event, you know, it's uh, those same troops that come to the table and uh, are willing to put up their time and their effort. And God knows it's not easy to raise money. But uh, when you do it as a collective, it can be fun. Yeah. Fuck. Right on. Uh, no, you guys are tired, man. I know I am. And time to dab the hell out. Dabs, man. Grow your own, grow in peace. Free the weed. Great show, Jay. Once again, great show, Jay. Here's Mike. All right. Thanks, Jason. Um, all right. So I'm going to play Freddie's video here. Let me just bring it up. And yeah, as I said, you can 
find a lot of stuff at pot.tv. You can find videos all week long, live shows. We got tons of stuff. Um, we got Marijuana Man on Wednesday. Now, he's been covering stuff. I didn't see Marijuana Man around here tonight. I'm not sure um, if he was in the crowd. Was he here? Oh, okay, cool. Oh, he's probably doing seed stuff over there, so he's been keeping us updated, too. Um, we don't want to forget him. But yeah, what, you can watch his show on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Redbeard's in the chat. You can watch him at 4 p.m. on Saturday, so tune in tomorrow for Redbeard. Pretty sure he's going to be doing a show. And uh, Opus's show, don't forget about Opus. Uh, he's on Monday at 4 p.m., so check that all out on Pod TV. Here's Freddie Pritchard's video. Love you guys lots. We'll see you soon. And peace. Enjoy. There we go. Yeah! yeah. Grow your own! Fuck your weed! Let's grow! The fuck out of my garden! Yeah. The weed! The holy smokes, uh... Pour it again, Neil, and... Two days uh, to go. We're, we're halfway through the second to last day here. This is frickin' day 14. Yeah, man. Damn, one more day. Yeah. How's that make you feel? We're getting close, and, and I'll tell you, Health Canada's presented nothing that uh, supports uh, banning people from growing their own uh, herbal medicine, I'll tell you, that's for sure. Good. Uh, today on the stand, they've got, uh, uh, I guess, the woman that's in charge of the program in the Netherlands to allow people to have cannabis for themselves. Uh, and, and they're basically charged uh, the equivalent of $10 a gram, Canadian, from the government to buy government wheat. And... Uh, <laughs> And that's their costs. That's, wow. that's what they figure they're not, they're not making profit. She said, no, this is the government. We're not making profit. This is just what we, we put our costs at. They've yeah. only got one supplier of, uh, of weed in the Netherlands, one company that supplies. One whole, one only company one supply company. all. He, they, they, they would like to have more. they got a monopoly. Uh, but, uh, but they don't. They, they put it out to tender for all Europe, for anyone in Europe that wants to grow weed for the Netherlands. they got one application. So, wow. yeah, not by the company that, that they're using. There's extensive screening done of anybody that wants to apply, criminal records checked. Uh, <coughs> Works out to 10 a gram, stuff, though. All kinds of restrictions that, uh, that they have to uh, uh, abide by as, as the grower for the government, right? And, and the vast majority of people that, uh, that use weed in the Netherlands do not get it from the government program. They, they get it from the coffee shops, or they're still the growing it for themselves illegally. The but you're not allowed to grow uh, plants at home at this point. To, uh, Fuck, that sucks. You know, and, and so that's what's So there's no there. growing, there's no personal growing for medical cannabis allowed in Netherlands? Not known there isn't. Well, that's kind of stupid. Even though we had a sign here that got. said that you could grow five plants in the Netherlands, that's not true. That's not true. Well, that's see. shown to be the case here. Uh, so yeah, just another example of, of how cannabis is treated uh, for, me for medicinal purposes and other purposes uh, in another part of the world, uh, in the Netherlands there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, right on. You know, she wasn't very forthcoming. Uh, John had to grill her quite a bit to, to get the truth out about how many people were actually accessing the government program and, and what was going on there. But they're not happy with the quality of the weed, much like uh, Prairie Plant Systems here. It was growing for Health Canada. Wow, well, that was and, uh, Most of the people reject the program that is offered to them. So, uh, Did you yeah. see that Prairie Plant System weed, Neil, in the gold yeah, I've package? Seen, I've seen that. Holy yeah, that. jumping Josephites. What the heck was that? It was designed to fail. That's oh, what it was. God, you know, like it all, all other aspects of Health Canada's program to, to give people the access that the courts demand that they do, uh, just all, all aspects of the Health Canada program have yeah. been designed to fail. That's it. They really aren't trying to honor what the courts have uh, told them to do since the Terry Parker decision. Uh, every step of the way, they're just trying to uh, curtail the rights of Canadians, uh, make it very difficult to access this, this plant, and very difficult to use it uh, properly as medicine. And it should be the opposite. You think your government should be doing the opposite. And yeah. And they're citizens. These are public servants. This is something that would serve the public, is to help them in their, in their pursuit of their own medical issues. Uh, with this amazing plant that's been used for thousands of years by hundreds of cultures. Yeah, and exactly. our government is still treating it like it's dynamite or poison, and, uh, and uh, Canadians should be using pharmaceuticals and alcohol instead of... Uh, yeah, actually, very well. It's a very, travesty. Very well said, Neil. Most uh, important court case we've had in the history of Canada going on right here. Right yeah, here. it is, and um, Freedom at its people have been watching us. Watching these videos, Neil, and we're coast to coast in other countries, and the well, comments, freedom. the comments that we're getting is very good. So it's good to have you 
uh, every day giving us your updates, you know, like along with Freedom Jeremiah. Freedom is on trial here. Yeah, right, that's, that's right. It. If, if they win this, there'll be no uh, there'll be no weed that's legal in Canada except that which comes from the licensed producers of Health Canada. So in all the Large dispensary pets. weed, all the weed that people are growing for themselves, all the growers that aren't licensed producers, all of that weed will be considered illegal in Canada and you'll be criminalized and penalized as we yeah, have yeah. been to this date if they get their way in here. Yeah. So this is really uh, at its core freedom on trial. Thanks, Neil. We'll Thanks. talk to you a little we'll later. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Oh, that's so how busy is it up there? Well, there's about 12 people um, just after morning break, so... Didn't seem like too many people up there today, but uh, I saw less on Tuesday. It was only six people after morning break, so it was a little bit more, like double than it was on Tuesday after morning break, so that's good. There's a few of us out here. We've been giving out flyers like crazy. And you got some Timbits, brought yeah, up we a, do. 50, got tin bits. a 50 pack of Timbits. 50 pack of Timbits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, did we up there first thing this morning? Pretty much, or? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, just to, I, I think I saw her sworn in, so I was actually up there pretty early this morning. What are they talking about? So it's a lady from Amsterdam, and she's the, oh, what they call her, department head or something of the Medical Office of Cannabis there, or Bureau of Medical Cannabis. And they um, were talking about the division between medical and recreational and how it's really separate. And so she, there's a lot of things she doesn't know. And then... Um, Oh, they're coming out behind me. I can they're see it. They're coming all out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here they come. Yeah. There's Jeremiah. Yeah, absolutely. John. So. John hey, man. Yes. Yeah. What's up? What's happening? Why don't you come over here and crash our party? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. We were just told that um, we were being watched on your channel because, uh, well, they find us quite, quite <laughs> comical. And they're quite happy about how we're reporting. Really? What's going on upstairs well, that's in the, the courthouse? Really? What Netherlands is talking about. That was a lady from... With the lady that just said mentioned yeah. that I wasn't actually sure which who she was. She was wearing the full garb though. So yeah, she's but she's not, not from. She's not. Country. Yeah, I'm, I know. Yeah, she's British. British. She's British. Yeah, I think that was Grace. She's trying to pick up on all the laws that we're doing here and I'm stuff sure like that. that. So they're paying attention, but um, Netherlands um, really um, showed that Bedroom was um, well. Their, their, their medical system failed where uh, in 2003 when they implemented a system they anticipated uh, 12 to 15,000 patients, 600 sign up, and since 2003, between 2015, 600 more have signed up, yeah. we've got 1,200. Uh, coffee shops are booming, but let's go into context. In 2003, there were 700 coffee shops. In 2014, as we know, there's only 200, so there's less yeah, that's growers. In, that's so in Amsterdam. Up. In Amsterdam. It, it, actually, there's 600, there's over 600 um, coffee shops in all the Netherlands as opposed to in the over a thousand there was before double that more than that there was tons of them yeah uh, so what, the, the woman who was speaking today is the head of the medicinal cannabis program in the Netherlands and so she was very very knowledgeable on everything that was happening in the Netherlands uh, and uh, basically she walked through kind of over the years how the programs <laughs> changed the specifics of the whole thing um, what she was trying to I, I guess basically all the witnesses in the last week have been more factual witnesses. They're providing a lot of information. Or sorry, in this last in this last week, um, they haven't been so biased in a certain way. So I think I think she was just providing information. Medicine. Yeah, she and how it helps. People. She had some of her own biases, but she yeah. was pretty fair about everything. Didn't really interject a lot of her own opinions into things. Um, so it was just more about the process of all of it. I think. Oh, and one thing that was brought up and very clear. In the Netherlands, people think they can grow five plants. That is wrong. Yes. They will not charge you. They will cut down your plants and take away, but you will not lose things. You will not go to jail for growing five plants unless proven well, that you're growing them to sell stuff like that. So that's kind of decriminal. Well, I, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's really you can get arrested. You can have your stuff taken away and seized, even if it's under five plants. Now, there's been some debate... Uh, with activists here in Canada, whether or not you can actually grow and if it's tolerated or not. Apparently, it's not. And apparently, over the past few years, it's gotten a lot worse. Whereas, say, maybe five years ago, you could have five plants in your balcony and you probably wouldn't be uh, under yeah. a heck of a lot of trouble or scrutiny. But now, I mean, there's still people who are growing, just like in Vancouver, where we have dispensaries. The cops can come and bust you at any time. They tolerate them here. Well, apparently, in the Netherlands, it's even worse than that. They're not tolerating any gardens at home now. They're cracking down on people. And that's one of the reasons why the people that, you know, 
people who want medical marijuana aren't allowed to grow it at home. They don't want to go to Bedrocan to get irradiated marijuana. There's only five strains There's available. Bedrocan over there too. Bedrocan is. They're the, they're the only ones. In 2003 yeah. in the that's Netherlands. Their home and, and there that's was the only two. legal pot there. They're like our prairie plant systems of yeah. yesteryear. Well, and, and so and they irradiated all and their they weed. Oh, wow. Year. That's not Bedrocan. The government irradiates it. Wow. No, no, no. The government wow. wants it to have irradiated. Retro can grows for the government, right? Then goes to another patching facility where it's radiated. Right. Have Petro you ever smoked? Who would not want to irradiate it though? The government forces them forces to irradiate them. it. Forces yeah. other companies to irradiate it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever smoked radiated uh, marijuana yourself that you know was radiated? Yeah, like, I did. I had on a weed back what? in 2007. Yeah, PPS weed. From PPS weed. That was radiated. Yeah. Oh, I guess then I smoked it too. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. why I glow. Every night, go smoke. Every night yeah. when I turn the lights off, I still glow green. Every night I turn the lights off so and oh and one, one just one quick question neil was saying that the medical marijuana in the netherlands there's like one company controlling it all and that's bedroom that's bedroom can and basically they they're the and only they ones right they only yeah. supply dried marijuana that is it that's yeah. it no, no concentrate uh, yeah. oil uh, but it's in consideration so. thanks for taking again time guys at lunch break for sure man uh, we'll see you anytime freddy right on free the weed man these guys come come yeah. guys. free the weed you're right on. You're up there drawing, eh, Corey? Yeah, that is the lady from uh, the Netherlands right there. That's what she looks like. Yeah, because yep. they don't let you. They won't let us have no cameras in there. No, but they can't stop me from drawing. No, because that's well, that's <laughs> what they've been doing since the dawn of time. Like when you see in the newspaper, yep. there'll be a drawing, right? Right on, Corey. So that's Corey. the opposing that's counsel. Good too. That's John Conroy in front of them talking. And that's the Crown's counsel right there. Nice. So, hey there. We're uh, down at the court here, day four. Dude, uh, you look good. Good, thank yeah. you. Thank <laughs> you. I wore my fancy coat today. Awesome. Yeah. Super. Uh, so, what's day 14? Uh, you've been hanging out up in the courtroom. I know, but that's um, what do you got? What's going on? I know they're talking. We talked a couple people. I, we, we, what we know, um, uh, that they've been talking to the people from the Netherlands. Yep. That's the, the lady from the Netherlands didn't really seem to have much solid information. I mean, she had a few ideas about how the system works there, but a lot of things she seemed rather puzzled and rather lost in the dark when, when John was asking specific questions about how their policy or how their their delivery to their patients is received by those patients. Um, and I think that's the most important part. That's what everybody seems to be overlooking, and, and at least media coverage of this, myself to be part, partially to blame for that, um, is that it's the input of the patients that's the essential part at this point. Yeah. And we're sitting here, I mean, Health Canada people have talked, People who have no real understanding or, I mean, they keep telling us the evidence for medical marijuana is anecdotal. But there's no actual scientific basis for it. But what is what is evidence if not anecdotal? I mean, we have yeah. people who, who are willing to say that this has been a game changer for them. Whether it was day one with Sean Davey or Neil Allard or, I mean, anybody who says, stood up there in, in, in support of this in between has just said, like, this is, this is our medicine. And we're simply in a position right now where we don't want to have to make that choice between our liberty and our and our medication, our liberty and our health. Yeah. And the way it seems is that, I mean, it, I understand government wanting to regulate an industry that right now is seen to be, it's the new Coke. You know, you look at the people who are involved in, in, in moving this forward. Yeah. It's people from big business, big, big pharma, big tobacco, Coca-Cola, Mr. Vicente had many ties to that. I mean, this is the this is the green rush, and we're standing at the, at the very beginning of it. Dude, they're legal to both north and the south. It, it is. Yeah. You know, you look at you look at places in the United States where they've legalized, whether it's Colorado, Washington D.C., any of those spots, it's been very successful, and they. It is a tide that's changing. Everyone knows this is eventually, within five years, within ten years, it's going to be legal. Right on. But it's just a matter of who's actually going to make the money off it. Yeah, and the, the control. Who, exactly, the control. And the people who they want to make the money are the people who are losing the money because this product, because this plant is able to solve so many problems. Yeah. So if they can come at the pharmaceuticals, if the pharmaceuticals can find out a way that they're still going to make money off this, of course they're going to have the ear of government, which they have already. So, I mean, this is what we're trying to decide, is whether we keep it at home so those who use can not only use but can grow and control their own supply or we leave it into the hands of someone else and someone like bed bedro can bedro can or which is like uh, from what we heard on the street from jeremiah over here a little while ago is that they're the only supplier in the Netherlands, only legal supply. So they have total control, won't they? A total control of yeah. five strains out of a possible three thousand plus. They have five strains that they're willing to bring to the market. Wow. I mean, to, to me, when you have the idea that, like, I've talked to many people who said, you know, if I do this strain, it makes me crazy, makes me suicidal, makes me on edge. But if I do this one, total, total relief. 
right? Yeah. So without that ability, that trial and error, what are people going to do? You got five possible strain options. Right. You're getting ten thousand. Yeah. You're getting, you're you getting dry, dried marijuana. You have no input into where it comes from. The process of drying any of it. Yeah. There's so many different variables that are involved, and I understand they're trying to streamline and make it somewhat consistent. But the thing is, it can't be consistent when we're dealing with thousands and thousands of different possible strains. That's just yeah. not the way it operates. So, I mean, for me, it's a pivotal case, a pivotal moment in deciding something that, like, it's obvious that this is going to be legal within a few years. I mean, even even in the United States, there's been a federal federal law introduced to say that medical marijuana on a federal statute would be legal in the United in States. In every state. In every state. In every on a federal, federal platform. And that's, that's game-changing. I mean, it's been... 70, 80, 90 years of prohibition that we're just sitting around waiting to end. Yeah. But now, now they're all this is is deciding who's going to make the money when they do it. Yeah. So I mean, I want to see a level playing field. Absolutely. If the LPs want to exist, let them I exist. If if I want to be able to grow my own though, uh, everybody should be having a level playing field. So no one person can control. A, a brilliant American author who was writing um, around the, the turn of the 19th or the, in the aughts, the turn of the 19th century, named Upton Sinclair. He wrote a lot on, on labor movements and on, you know, how how government and business and, and the regular people interact. And one of the things that he said was, government making something illegal has never been able to stop everyone from doing it. So, it's just all live that yeah, way. Yeah, right on. No, no, Thanks, no, Danny, for no uh, talking with us down here on uh, Georgia Street, right in front of the courthouse on day 14. Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. All right. But, all yeah? Right. Oh, yeah? All right. Take a me, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Love ya. Right on. I <laughs> love you too, buddy. Look, Freddy How's it going, guys? Hey, face. Freddy. How you doing, Dave? How you doing, man? Uh, you uh, were you work? up there all day, Dave? No, no, I just came to uh, make sure Conroy knew what I knew about uh, Dutch growing. Apparently, the judge isn't interested in the Dutch growing thing, but since uh, this has kind of sparked a debate in our community of what the real situation is on Dutch growing, personal growing, yeah. uh, five, it's going to be... It's going to be an article for Cannabis Culture occurring in the near future. Sweet, sweet. And uh, we'll get everybody the latest information on that subject. Awesome. Right, we did talk to Freddie a little earlier about whether or not people could actually grow at home or whether or not. That's under debate. Apparently, David has dug up that five plants grown outdoors, like yes. on a balcony or something like that, has not led to charges. No I mean, charges. To some activists. And the police leave it alone if but. there is no complaints. Right. No smell complaints. It's, so basically. it's still pretty lax there in some ways. I understand. But it was they will under- take your plants and just destroy them, and then sometimes they leave you with five plants, sometimes they'll take all of them. And there are some indoor grows that are tolerated by the police, and we have photos of last year's 2014 indoor sanctioned harvest, so we'll get all the photos in that article, too. Awesome. And then, uh, I understand it was an economist there this afternoon. Yeah, so, so yes, number that's talking. right. Grutendorst. 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 I would say he was very good in the beginning yeah. of being able to stand the He started right. Concepts. He started right. And, and I thought, he like, got, I became thought, very I evasive. He, got lured in. he became very abrasive. He was like, yeah. I'm talking this kind of like this. But he knew nothing about cannabis. He knew nothing. He had no statistics for the compassion of those, what they're selling, no. what it costs of growing. He was the a only pharmacist. Statistic, the only statistics <laughs> yeah. he had was, thank you, David. Very well. Well, he was an, econ- he was an economist. An and economist. And about farm pharmaceuticals. So he was an economist about the pharmaceutical industry. Was just but the pharmaceutical industry is very yeah, different LPs, than the marijuana industry. Now, he didn't know basic basic facts about the about LPs, about the medical marijuana industry in Canada. He didn't even know there was dispensaries until he was walking around the city. Sounds like our health Canada people that were exactly. up there didn't have a clue what was going on. He had no right. idea what yeah. they were selling in town, but Leafly put on their thing, and I read on the news, and I read heard on the news radio right in Washington, 3.2 million on local compassion clubs in BC alone in December. Wow. Hell, Canada doesn't know it, but we're hearing it on local radios and it's on leafly.com. The wow. pharmacy model is not the model we want for peppermint, not the model we want for Echinacea, and by gosh, not the model we want for cannabis either. Absolutely. We want the uh, coffee bean model or the natural health care product model. Uh, cannabis yeah. should be in there with the other plants, not treated like a pill. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Well said, man. Yeah. Very much so. so and and <coughs> I thought, though, Tanya Grace was the reporter from the Allard side who was cross-examining Grutendorst, and she just totally cut him down to size, really pointed out the fact that he didn't know. It wasn't really hard to, to point it out, though, because the guy was not answering even the most basic of questions. He just couldn't figure out what she was trying to get to. And so I think, I think at one point she was getting a little frustrated because he just wasn't getting anything, and the but judge was I, getting frustrated. I, the judge was like this. You know, he rolled his eyes at one point. And stuff, yeah, so. yeah. Um, no, so tomorrow's the last day. 
you guys, I know well, you're glad. It's not the last day. You know what's really interesting, we said at the end of the day, is, is because of we have everything's got to go on to paper, and John asked for 60 pages, and I think they asked They asked for 100. It's the last day of testimony tomorrow, but then there's going to be uh, final arguments, oh. and that's coming up in uh, April. 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 Yeah, April. okay. So yeah, it's not quite, but tomorrow's the last day of testimony. That's right. Yeah. Last day of witness testimony, then we come back, I think, around Easter. Are oh, we going to need to be on the street for that? <coughs> Probably. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If it's in this building, no, we won't be here for Easter because John will be doing dealing with the murder case. Right. And at the same time, we're dealing with the Owen Smith case where Kurt's going. Right. So, uh, they asked for just after they asked for April 2nd and April 7th to go back to court. Well, that's what was discussed. And we'll hear about that more tomorrow. And then it actually the goes days. through April. Yeah. Into like the, I think, the May 1st. Oh, wow. yeah, what, what, we had tomorrow? May 1st. So. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow is tomorrow's final argument. Eric Nash. 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 Eric It'll Nash. be interesting. He's the final witness. Then. Final witness. Yeah, Eric Nash, a cultivator. He's a plaintiff's witness, so for our side. It's going to be interesting. Then. And it the only thing fun. that health candidates, the only thing the defense are going to look at is Eric Nash's testimony. That's it. Thanks a lot. Guys. I wonder if they'll be in there on April 20th. <laughs> and we're just a block away uh -huh. at the cannabis farmer's market. That'd be interesting. We should get a lot of people here with signs if that's oh, the dude, case. Oh, dude, you could fill you up the to. whole building. We wouldn't need oh, any signs. 30,000 people. Just a side just note of our 420 thing here. You know how we put our second stage at the back on the back stairs? Yeah. I have a letter in my email box from Kale, the city official. Yeah. Forbidding us from putting the stage there, Whoa. saying it will, will not be allowed. She says. So oh, we'll see what happens. I think we're gonna have to have a conversation with them. And I haven't been busted in a long time. Yeah, they're trying to get a group, <laughs> get a group really down push. at that office. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, last time I was to. busted was Burnaby Mountain, and I don't regret that one. I haven't regretted any of them. No, actually. we don't. We don't have a choice but to move and expand our entire you thing out. So. Yeah, you can't stop that farmer's market from getting bigger. You no. just got to make it safer yep. and allow it to grow as big as it's going to grow. And it is big. It's, it is pretty big already. Yeah. Yeah. Come join us. <laughs> 30,000 of our closest friends are going to be one block away from here at the Art Gallery, April 20th. Cannabis farmer's market. Oh, what, you know, what could be better than a big old stinky cannabis farmer's market with free music <laughs> and entertainment? And a, a joint giveaway at 4.20 p.m. Awesome. Free marijuana. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for talking and being in the courtroom and giving us all the reports. Awesome. Fuck, that's going to be a great picture right there, man. Fucking free the weed. Stoners, unite! Is medicine. Yeah, free the weed. Yeah, sir. Free the weed. Yeah. Good night.